अंग्रेज अपना लगान और न्यूज लॉन्ड्री अपना हफ्ता कभी नहीं छोड़ते वेलकम टू अनदर एपिसोड ऑफ हफ्ता वी रिकॉर्डिंग दिस एट फोर पी एम ऑन थर्सडे द इलेवेंथ ऑफ अप्रिल एंड टुडे इज ईद सो ईद मुबारक टू एवरीबडी ईद मुबारक यस तो लेट मी इंट्रोड्यूस द पैनल बट बिफोर आई डू दैट दिस हफ्ता विल ऑल्सो बी फ्री इट्स नॉट बिहाइंड द पे वॉल एंड द होल थिंग विल यूल ऑन वीडियो ऑन यूट्यूब इज वेल वी विल बी पुटिंग स्टफ बिहाइंड द पे वॉल I think closer to the end of the election because a lot of uh, people who are a part of our subscriber base and even within the organization feel that uh, we should have as little stuff as possible behind the paywall. Uh, I will keep pushing to put stuff behind the paywall because we have to sign checks, and until we pull stuff behind the paywall, many of you don't pay. So I'm hoping that will incentivize you. But those of you who pay just because journalism should not be funded by government ads. or large corporations i'm hoping you will the link for our election fund projects is in the show notes below we have a total of i think seven funds three have been topped up four still need to be topped up and more important than that tell friends of yours relatives to subscribe and pay to keep news free because when the public pays the public is served when advertisers pay advertisers are served and you will see till the end of elections uh, there'll be a lot of advertising by those close to certain political parties and governments and sarkari ads so on that note in the studio with me let me introduce our guest first is yamini ayer hi yamini hi thank you for having me yes pleasure first time you've come for hafta no yes, yes. <laughs> wow okay do we have called her on many occasions <laughs> oh right so <laughs> yamini is the former president and chief executive of the center for policy research cpr Her research interests lie in the field of social policy and development. She's a TED fellow, also a founding member of the International Experts Panel of the Open Government Partnership. She's been a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Council on Good Governance, and recently the pieces of hers that you can read in the links below. One is on evidence policy making and critiquing it in a polarized polity. This is in the Deccan Herald. and the second is techno welfare delivery by modi how cash transfers are manufacturing political power in india this is on scroll the links to both pieces are in the show notes welcome yamini thank you so what keeps you busy now other than writing that's it there's a lot to write about isn't there and to chat with you guys <laughs> yes also in the studio manisha pande hello who is going to be heading adding more costs to a already struggling news laundry when are you heading out uh 17th Going to Kerala first. Wow, सबसे expensive ticket. Sri Lanka ही चले जाते हैं. सबसे नीचे. हाँ, आज की बहुत expensive. हमें देख रही थी. We did have yeah. thoughts about it's it. It's cheaper than, going to Sri Lanka. Then he said that's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> How does it matter to us? <laughs> Not my problem, huh? So yeah. No, but I. No, so we're going to be there. Uh, and Dhania is going to be joining us. So we're going to be doing a couple of shows from Kerala and Karnataka both. चलो. Dhania is तो Bangalore, Kerala the flight yeah. ticket isn't that much हमारे लिए. देखे. अब कौन देगा ये पैसा? तो एंड प्रोड्यूसर भी जा रही प्रियाली वंडरफुल प्रोड्यूसर्स आल्सो कंपनी हो चलो जी एंड वी ऑलरेडी हैव रिपोर्टर्स इन राजस्थान बिहार असम एंड आई होप दे वॉक आई होप दे वॉक दे ट्रेन्स दे ट्रेन्स चल हम गरीबों की हम दिस इज मिडिल वी आर डूइंग द सेकंड ऑन अनरिजर्वड वी वी डूइंग द मिडिल क्लास इलेक्शन कवरेज Not the by flight. Also, no, you should be doing the one day Bharat election coverage. No, we didn't yes. let them take Rajdhani one day Bharat. We said you have to travel like the regulars do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> joining us online is uh, our very own Jeshree, who joins from her hometown of Chennai. Hello, hello, and I am costing you no money this election. I will stay put. So, Chalo, very no good. ticket expenses for me. Very nice. Thank you. See, that's the kind of person we need. <laughs> just just <laughs> news laundry we needs needs more jeshries <laughs> who can just sit in one place and pay lo gyan yeah and also joining us is rashid kidwai welcome rashid hello yeah it's a pleasure being here where are you joining us from uh, i'm i'm in bhopal now oh you're in bhopal i see bhopal has some very good naan khatai and also uh, uh, biryani yes yes i think uh, there are a lot of things are there but well, the city is very uh, peaceful not so much politically but uh, at a you know social and environment level it's a very peaceful town yes that it is i agree for those of you who don't know rashid he is a senior journalist he's author and a political analyst he's a visiting fellow with the observer research foundation he tracks indian government political parties and hindi cinema 
So which these days is very close. It's it's very political. This is the most political Hindi cinema has been in a long time, and unfortunately, in the circumstances that we are in right now, he's authored several books. Among them, Twenty Four Akbar Road, The House of Sindhya, The Saga of Power, Pol Politics, and Intrigue, and Neta Abhineta, Bollywood Star Power in Indian Politics. I must check this last one out. I'm going to order that. I'll order your Neta Abhineta. Sounds very interesting. So thank you for joining us, Rashid. Uh, before we get into the headlines, which Jeshi will give us, just quickly because we have both policy wonks here. Policy is a very good space these days. I have heard. I don't know if it's true. I heard from Manisha and with journalists like her, you never know if it's true or not. <laughs> that there will be soon launching a a, a, a think tank by yeah. Adani. Just yes. like RF hai. Adani will also be. We call Chintan uh, Research Foundation with a corpus of hundred crore. CRF. Or, so that agar C, ORF ka CRF ho gaya. C, so, and half of it missing so dude you guys will have half jobs to choose <laughs> there will be a bidding war yeah, for policy wonks I is it going to be that ke... exciting I think I will write a paper I will check sign karte to in ko, Kerala ke liye. what do you think Rashid is, is the policy stuff really heating up I think it's, a, it's one area that uh, uh, it's very upcoming but a lot of application is required. I think when uh, sort of a business house decides, it has to have some kind of uh, you know sense of detachment in terms of how uh, government is functioning, how policies are actually you know formulated. So look, if you look at uh, history of other think tanks in India, they basically were, were uh, non-political. Even they were partially funded by corporate houses at all. There's a long history and there's a lot of uh, I would say uh, highs and lows uh, till they arrived. Hmm. So it's not like, uh, you know, setting up a media house. So it's far more complicated. I see. So, but these days, everything is so political. I mean, even really make my trip is whatever, what ease my trip. Who was that? Who was, jo, who weighed in on foreign policy? Ease that we will not trip. book tickets to Maldives or Mauritius ease or whoever. Trip, I think, yeah. what, what do you think, Yamini? Is it something that... So, I'm on a sabbatical. I see. <laughs> so, I'm taking a break from, from the world of policy. No, but I, I think, look... Uh, there, there are uh, several layers to this um, that are worth unpacking. There's no question that as policy is a complicated animal and in a democratic context, policy should never be left just to the technocrats, uh, the Mandarin sitting in North Block, South Block uh, and state capitals across the country to make policy. Um, it uh, In a democratic context, the multiplicities of voices of different kinds, whether social movements or technocratic policy think tanks that bring expertise into the on into the high table where decisions are made are important because after all how else do you get feedback how mm. else do you understand complexities of decisions how else do you negotiate and ultimately good politics policy is also about good politics because mm. every policy will have winners and losers and it requires degrees of negotiation so to have more is always a good thing more expert institutions more spaces where dialogue takes place the question is uh, to what extent are these going to follow fundamental first principles? Good evidence-based research requires you to have the full freedom, the full intellectual freedom, the full academic freedom to be able to ask questions that will make everybody hot under the collar, not very different to journalism. That's our job. And in the process of asking these questions with completely unbiased lenses, have the freedom and flexibility to go collect evidence and find answers. And often those answers are not going to be the answers that you started out with. All research has bias in the sense that there are set, there are frameworks, there are ideological frameworks, there are Just theoretical you frameworks look, yeah. within which you, exactly. Uh, but you have to arrive at using empirical evidence and, and, and arguments and, and reasoning, arrive at sets of conclusions, right? So to have the freedom to do all of that. Now, if we, um, the, 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 the whole thing hinges on the extent to which these freedoms are preserved. Um, the financing of research of what think tanks uh, uh, do has is, is a complex issue. So where do you, after all, research is expensive. State mm -hmm. funding, um, 
corporate funding. There are many examples across the world. Even you look at universities, uh, big capital backs this. Uh, and then there's a degree of quote unquote crowdsourcing funding, but research is an extreme expensive mm. proposition. Increasingly so as methods of collecting data have become more and more sophisticated, it requires high levels of skills, it requires large numbers of people. So the resources question has a, been a complex one. In India, we've never we had state funding for research, uh, but actually the social in the social sciences, this has always been very limited. Tradition historically, in fact, I think that's been one of the big failures of higher education in India. There has been a lot more focus focus on teaching in the university structure and far less on actually building out research centers, research centers yeah. like the one I used to head, the Center for Policy Research. It was basically folk, PhD folks sitting there, folks who in any other context would probably have been part of a research center in a university, they but in our know. structure that doesn't exist. Right. So no. you create this think tank structure. And, and, and CPR's predominantly its funding was from, it was dependent on just a handful of like no, so, so, they, so So here's the thing. So state funding has always been limited. In the course of the 90s and 2000s, it became heavily bureaucratized to the point where process was all that it was. And it became very difficult to actually have genuine flexibility. And, uh, you know, this was not necessarily on principles of academic freedom alone, but it was just excessive bureaucracy. The license Raj that Indian industry wanted to free itself of was very much prevalent in Indian academia. I mean, mm. it's literally there are scores. There was a scoring. There's a scoring system for how you hire. There's limited flexibility. Our bureaucracy operates on one size fit all. That is the structure that was brought into this funding. The other space that really opened up historically, India has had a deep tradition of global philanthropy in India, which set up some of our best institutions. Ford Foundation came on invitation by Pandit Nehru back in the day and actually gave core endowment funding for all the institutions that we uh, proudly say are ours. IITs, IIMs, you name it, okay? And and in fact, to build good institutions... So the endowments that came from Ford Foundation. It came from Ford Foundation. Uh, to build good institutions. So, so who were the big fu funders that created institutions in, this, in the 50s, 60s, 70s? There was, there was a pocket full of Indian industrialists, the Tatas being the most significant. And then the Ford Foundation. I mean, there isn't an institution in India that we proudly call ours that hasn't at some point received some kind of endowment fund of that nature. In the 2000s, with Silicon Valley funding coming into sort of global philanthropy, Gates Foundation being a big example, over time, several others, Hewlett or Mediar, you name it, the scale of global philanthropy expanded significantly. But Indian private capital was a lot less generous with its pockets in that it wasn't thinking in the institution building frame of what the Tatas did, in fact, in, the, in those early days. I think that at least from what I have seen, read, observed, the the Parsis of Bombay seem a lot less motivated in their philanthropy than you know many others. You know, it's also like um, maybe it's a Parsi thing. <laughs> I don't know, but it's also that we kind of conflated ch charitable activity with the equivalent of philanthropy. This institution building imagination was very limited. Hmm. To some degree, our Bangalore Silicon Valley folks kind of came into play a little bit uh, in the late two thousands. Probably, you know, looking to the example that was set by all the big Silicon Valley philanthropies, Gates, uh, now there's uh, some, uh, there, I mean, there, there's many of them. But I mean, so, so it meant that a lot of Indian research institutions and think tanks ended up just because of the limitations of state funding became quite reliant on global philanthropy coming through the infamous FCRA. Mm. Um, and private Which capital, has been cancelled kilo ke hisab se over the last few years. 17,000 cancelled kar diye. Oh, wow. को लटा के बिठाए हैं कि तीन महीने छह महीने देखी जाएगी ऐसे ऐसे करके सबको लाइन पे लगाने का सबसे अच्छा सिस्टम तो uh, that that was one thing, and then you know there's been little smattering of corporate philanthropy. ORF is an example, uh, you know, setting up of you know private universities. That's where a lot of private capital went. Less so in this so-called think tank space. Although this idea that you need to have technocrats, you know, a, from the outside engaging with government, uh, private capital very strongly believes that the Indian bureaucracy has too many generalists. Usme expertise ki zarurat hoti hai. You can't be thinking of telecom sure. and data and falana falana. There are truths to all of this. But in 
the the ultimately the big question that india is facing today so our current government which is likely to uh, be our next government is uh, has framed the narrative so we in our the fcra law came in the late 1970s there's always been this tension between foreign funding and what it does to quote unquote national interests foreign hand um the 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 invisible and sometimes very visible foreign hand by the way green revolution happened largely through research funding that came from foreign funding but for mm. foundation anyway there is no uh, i we i would welcome the indian phila- indian private capital to contribute heavily into philanthropy and the indian state to get rid of its shackles and start financing research both in the sciences and the humanities better there is no country can enter the 21st century without all of this but we have to remember principles if research gets funded through big corporate houses in ways that then require that research to give up on its principles then we are in for a very difficult time uh, but so, i think that's inevitable because we can because, watch ndtv to no, surmise no, what but, but no because the world we live <laughs> in is like the, the, i don't think that motivation earlier it, a lot of research news anything was not tied to the interests of whoever was giving the money today i think there's such an inevitability to that that i've stopped even hoping for that but so sorry let me just ju- can i just quickly close two seconds that th- there are two things corporate philanthropy uh, that has agendas funding research you see this even in washington okay so uh, it the think tank community it is what the profession the, the lines that the profession chooses to draw for itself so this is for people like us to think about uh, as as members of the profession but secondly also what we don't have in india which which america has is laws that allow you to register as a lobbyist okay then there is complete transparency there is a difference between lobbying which is a perfectly legitimate activity and between being an independent non-partisan expert voice on sets of issues which may or may not be backed backed by certain kinds of financing and the ideas of conflict of interest should be clearly laid out then we are in a okay place but absent that we really risk the gray zones and as you say given the current environment the gray zones are self evident generalists i mean even um i mean i don't really have a position on that uh, and we'll you know i think we'll come back to the discussion in more detail after the headlines but mckinsey is also generalists but yet they charge shit loads to restructure your businesses etc but they're all gen- like someone who's you know written a report on a manufacturing plant that is making vegetable oil will next year be writing one on you know streamlining processes in eco tourism or something so so but in some places it is seen as you know highly accomplished professionals in the bureaucracy it's not seen as that what determines that you know we can discuss in a little more detail but first let's get the headlines because then i would like to go to rashid on two things one is since you've written so much on the congress i have uh, i was attending a a, a book uh, launch kehte hain na news ex editorial director i think she is uh, priya segal uh, on contenders and the uh, panelists were pavan verma abhishek manu singhvi and uh, ram madhav and uh, it was interesting about uh, the congress and its role so we'll come back to rashid on that and of course as a policy wonk but first uh, jayesh will give us the headlines and manisha will give us the little extra after that hmm what a fun time it's been so in a major setback to arvind kejriwal the delhi high court has dismissed his petition against the ed arrest hmm. the delhi cm has now moved the supreme court and in fact as we speak this morning they have also removed the appointment of his pa bibhav kumar on this obscure rule i mean the level at which they're going to no, crush no and shailendra sharma who is the uh, special appo- i yes. forgot exactly what his title was but he played a pivotal role in some education. education reform and he wasn't even ca- taking a salary no he yeah. wasn't taking a salary i mean they're just it's just that and mm-hmm. this tarikh pe tarikh pe tarikh so petty they hung in related news brs leader k kavita who is currently in judicial custody under ed arrest was arrested by the cbi while in jail hmm. while in jail right on wednesday the supreme court hit out at patanjali yet again rejected the second set of apologies filed by ramdev and balkrishna for misleading ads it said the court said we are not blind and it also hit out at the uttarakhand licensing authority saying we will rip you apart what does that mean I'm just saying like I mean we will rip you apart is very harsh words for a court no supreme court I not be but scared But I will say that you know as fun as it is to see sort of potentially get into trouble and get ripped apart and all those things I think you should also I think it really reminds us of what a colossal muck up 
COVID management was like a like a mess of unprecedented proportions, both commission and omission. And I feel like this major sin that we constantly see in India today is these insane sort of pseudo scientific lies that have fooled so many people and have also led to deaths. And like even my very enlightened state of Tamil Nadu is not exempt from this. The DMK during COVID was doling out Siddha Ayurvedic treatments like Abhisura Kudinir. The only difference being that it wasn't backed by a major company like Patanjali. And so therefore there was no crony capitalism here, but it was still bad enough. So No, but you know, to that point, I thought you would, say, you would go on to say that, you know, that they should crack down on all FMCG who make fraudulent claims, yeah. which is this what... Is like a, this is the first step that they should be taking in this entire thing because we are seeing so much of it. And like so many of my family believes implicitly in the idea of Patanjali and how it's safer and healthier and so mm. on. So... Anyway. But uh, the oh. I, I, but I I will say that um, Arnab did this full show that you know Supreme Court has done this now they maybe they should do something on other way because none of them want to protect Babaji because they look bad but while that's anyway. what they want to do because we saw what Babaji did on Republic's show picking up Arnab, Arnab and they, they should have just yeah giggling that all they needed to do was do some cuddlies and say we love each other so much. I will you <laughs> Amazing, <laughs> Same thing on you know India Today. Oh, Baba Ji, you are so great, etc. So, like he's he's the first guy to give cure. Yeah, this was said. Much said it, this was said on TV. So they will not. So they don't want to say, oh, how dare you? So they say, oh, what about the rest? So that is news yeah. in India Today. Uh, I want to say, how many of them advertise on your show? Naam bol na. Itnai concern hai, naam bol apne show pe. Right. Next, the Congress launched its manifesto where reiterated promises made earlier, such as a nationwide caste census and legal guarantee of MSP. It's mm. also promised to scrap Agnipath, restore JNK's statehood, and launch a Mahalakshmi scheme to provide one lakh per year to one woman in every poor household. Mm. Uh, some... Modi said it reflects the thinking of the Muslim League. I so... don't see how, but yeah. Hmm. Next, the CSC's pre-poll survey is out, which points to unemployment and inflation being key issues this general election. More than half of respondents expressed concerns pertaining to price rise and fewer jobs in the country. Are you surprised, anyone? That's the main issue. Unemployment, media didn't make it so, but... Yeah. It was there even if in the India the media, Today polls, if you just... remember. Was it? The India Today Sea Water poll had unemployment as yeah. a top headline. <clears throat> hmm. In other unsurprising news, a report by ADR revealed that 16% of the candidates in the first phase of the Lok Sabha polls have criminal cases against them. Hmm. Of this, 36% are from the BJP and 34% from the Congress. Right. In Jammu and Kashmir, after failing to reach a settlement with its India Alliance ally, the NC, the PDP has fielded candidates in all three seats in the Kashmir Valley. Mahbubha Mafti has said they are forced to go slow, solo now. Ramayana actor and BJP Meerut candidate Arun Gobal faced backlash for going against EC norms and campaigning with a framed photograph of Lord Ram. I, that's an interesting conversation that should you be allowed to use religion while contesting election. But we'll come back to that later in the show. I want to get the panel's view on that. Days after the YouTube channel of Bolta Hindustan was taken off the platform after a notice by the INB ministry, the digital news portal National Dastak said the ministry has also asked YouTube to remove their channel. And Another outfit called Article 19 also received a similar notice. And uh, but uh, a lot of these f f tractor trailer, you know, the the farm protest Twitter accounts have been reinstated just before uh, Mr. Musk comes here. So I'm wondering how and why they were reinstated. Hmm. Hmm. I didn't <coughs> I didn't catch that headline. In Manipur, 11 months after ethnic violence broke out, Prime Minister Modi has said in an interview that the timely intervention of the state of the center, along with efforts by the state government led to a marked improvement in the situation. This is called... You can read, uh, you can watch his uh, BJP MLA's interview on News Laundry, who said that the PM's silence is troubling back at the peak of the violence. So right. their own MLA would disagree with this. This is called, I don't know how you pronounce the word, chutzpa. It's not chutzpa, no? This chutzpa. is how it was How it was defined in Haider. Chutzpa. chutzpa. And one thing Haider. interesting to note about um, Modi's uh, interview spree before the election is he has not spoken to any of the Godi ones still mm. now. Yeah. Kanti TV, then uh, Assam, Assam Tribune. And today he met some gamers mm. he's chatting with, but he's not given any interview to the usual suspects. The so usual Godi. He also spoke to Newsweek. Right. Yeah, I thought it was quite surprising. Which was passed off as an interview, but it was yeah. my diary, my thoughts. <laughs> then in Kerala, the Idiki Diocese screened the Kerala story for children in classes 10 to 12 to spread awareness against love jihad. This is days after the chief minister said Durdashan should not screen the film. 
So church mm-hmm. versus church. And- and there's no, some other church- elite Christians, like so-called Syrian Christians, have always been very Islamophobic. Like, I think one of the earliest uses of this entire love jihad bogey came from came from them because the church was very insular and very worried about you know the people from the flock marrying outside, especially women, because how dare women marry out of the fold? So I think then they've done the stupid thing of placing all their bets on the BJP because they say we have a shared sort of enemy, enemy. but then they don't realize that the BJP's enemy is also the Christians, albeit to a much smaller mm. degree. So. It's a very beautifully short-sighted plan. Although that's what they did in Goa too. With Manohar Parikar, he actively wooed the Christian community there and they were mm. supposed to be a big chunk of their voter. Then Modi made his seventh visit to Tamil Nadu this week. There was also a war of words between sundry politicians. Dayanadi Maran called Anamalai a joker and said, who is that? Modi hit back that the, BJ- that the DMK is very arrogant. You know, the AI DMK also made its first direct attack on Modi with EPS saying his visits are of no use. Irrespective of Anamalai's future, it's never nice when politicians say, who's that? And it never ends well. Sheila Dixit's comment with Arvind Kejriwal. You've had recently Mayavati's nephew also on the question of Chandrasekhar saying, who's that? Firstly, we know who you know they are. So it's very, but, you know, but, it's but very that's not genuine thing, also. <laughs> it's very childish, but it really hurts. So it's a very <laughs> yeah. effective yeah. little insult. It would hurt I me like also it. if someone says, who's, what's news laundry? A lot of, lot of people in the media do that. News laundry? <laughs> it Never makes me it. fuck all difference. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, next, um, six years after the arrest, the Supreme Court has granted bail to activist and former Nagpur University professor Shoma Sen, who was arrested and charged under the UPA, UAPA sorry, in the Elgar Parishad case. Shocking. Just the, this entire case and the amount of time it's taken. Yeah, it's, it's just, just process just... punishment to a, takes it to a whole right. other degree. The NCRT has deleted at least three references to the Babri Masjid demolition from CBSE's Class 12 textbook. The lesson now gives primacy to the Ram Janmabhoomi movement. And it's, how do you, how are they talking about Ram Janmabhoomi movement without talking about Babri Masjid? Like, why was there a movement in the uh, first place? The so there was no mosque. Without talking about the <laughs> uh, Delhi Minister Raj Kumar Anand resigned from his post and the Aam Aadmi Party on Wednesday over the issue of alleged corruption within the party. He has not joined the BJP yet, but we have lots of Hafte ki Adla Badli. You had a former Congress MLA, Ganga Jal Meel and PCC Vice President Sushil Sharma, who joined the BJP in Rajasthan. Uttarakhand, a former Cabinet Minister and three-time MLA Dinesh Agarwal switched from Congress to the BJP. Former Union Minister Birinder Singh on Monday quit the BJP and returned to the Congress. This is after a gap of 10 years. With his wife. In Gujarat, Rohan Gupta, who is a former Congress spokesperson, joined the BJP on Thursday. Yep, so that's the Adla of the week. But this Anand, the AAP minister from Delhi, his resignation apparently hasn't reached the speaker yet. So I'm not sure what's happening. But, but thank Those you. are the headlines for the week, yes. Yes, thank you for the headlines. And uh, we shall now get into the discussions. So Rashid, uh, two questions. One is on policy. Um, how much generalists, how the bureaucracy versus... Consultants, McKinsey, both are generalists, but one are considered very smart, the other is not so much. Or they are smart, but not so desirable. Secondly, little uh, anecdote from several years ago, about I think seven, eight years ago. There is a very large conference that happens every year. It's a media-related conference. I'm not about the Media Rumble. It's about 100 times bigger than Media Rumble. It's huge. It has media, entertainment, it has news, it has yevo. And every year, a report is prepared of that by one of the big four or big six or whoever it is. You know, these big consultants. And a friend of mine, whose suit at that time was more than my monthly salary, came and had lunch with me, which I paid for, and said, "What? tell me about media. You know, you've been in broadcast, you've started digital labor. So over lunch, I just bullshitted for about an hour, hour and a half, and I told him what all I understood was the media. Uh, then when I saw the report that came out, he had just basically, I think he must have spoken to two other people like me, and he had prepared, like he had not even bothered to change the syntax of the shit I said. I was like, dude, this is how they're preparing reports and charging enough to buy those suits. Then maybe News Laundry should pivot and start preparing report, <laughs> reports or conferences. So, yeah. So, tell me about what is your take on the role of policy or, or of uh, think tanks? Uh, how fair it is to expect them to be non-partisan or non-motivated? And after that, I'll come to the Congress question. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, on on question of think tanks and policies, it's very uh, clear. Of course, Yamni has elaborated in a you know broadly what has been a sort of historical context and how things are you know working and all. The real uh, 
thing uh, i think uh, uh, for uh, till this this era of globalization started then the several uh, i i won't say wasted interest several lobbies have been at work and there is a tendency to not to tell what to think but what to think about and that is being a real uh, sort of you know scope of it so the people are uh, more or less things are uh, uh, it's being done to create some kind of informed choice or uh, uh, give a perspective of things to come and that is where uh, a lot of consultants are there and uh, 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 policy matters are highlighted but i don't think the bureaucracy has lost control at end of the day it is the indian bureaucracy that is officers who are actually calling shots they get a lot of papers from a lot of people but they would do things and they tailor made and politicians are uh, i would say uh, i have seen a lot of politicians and a lot of ministers uh, end of the day their subject knowledge or their domain expertise is very little so they are guided by uh, uh, by the is lobby so the is lobby which is calling shots even now there are a lot of consultants are there in government of india uh, uh, many management you know gurus are there but still uh, the policy initiatives has been uh, remain a sole domain of the is but so are you saying uh, think tanks are disguised unemployment they don't have impact they're just <laughs> they're just they're getting a salary ki chalo ji is it manrega for intellectuals lot of quality research think tanks offer a lot of quality research you are asking me how much is it influenced i mean how, how much they are influencing the government thinking or government policy initiatives in that sense i am saying government let's say if government of india has a lot of paper from you know sanitization to water problem to food to agriculture to everything but the pick and choose it's not that you know think tanks are giving a lot of uh, uh you know quality research papers to to the government of india government of india is implementing it they pick and choose so there a lot of eclecticism that is at work ha you thought you were saying yeah so just question. two things because you asked a question that is just so tempting to jump into is <laughs> something that i thought about and by the way to at the risk of self promotion also written about and i'll send you the link to add to this hmm. because it's a really big issue. so i think there are two things one is the question of are we just narega for uh, so called intellectuals you know that's not a bad thing because mm. it the whole w- what makes for a robust public sphere and what makes for a good democracy is contestation of ideas our job is to use our skills to contribute to that process which also has a link to the policy making process i would like to share my data my understanding my uh, th- uh, drawing on my craft as a, as a researcher with the government but it's not my job to actually do the job of government government has to take input and ultimately arrive at its conclusions mm. and you have to be there for the long jure so big ideas for example one of the most important questions we build schools children are not learning do we first accept that idea and how do we think about it that broke came into the public discourse because an independent research organization an ngo that worked in the space of this of education for 10 years repeatedly every year was putting out a survey telling you that 50% of children going to standard 5 can barely read a standard 2 text Pratham this is important research. work which should add to changing the terms of the discourse how the answer has come will is is yeah. it's always is, is a process secondly on this question of consultants the biggest change in the many decades i have spent doing policy has been that it suddenly moved from jhola wala inputs to suit suited wala. boot wala mm. inputs okay and the cost of their inputs the price of their inputs as you say the suit is more expensive than not just your monthly salary but i would say six month ke salary <laughs> okay uh, i you know and and it is uh, so so where is this coming from I, you know i i jokingly often say that the mckinsey guy knows how to make that power point presentation much better than any of us jhola wala types which is why the mckinsey guy is there getting all the big contracts and the rest of us are not okay just a joke but there is an element of truth in it over decades the biggest challenge that the indian bureaucracy faces and frankly our indian politicians of all hues has been this complete atrophy of the capability of the indian state to get basic things done there are many reasons for it state capacity is now become an area of study for folks like me and it means that when a bureaucrat comes in and is trying to find answers to through problems they are kind of looking to see what is the quickest way in which i can get input and they draw on these suited booted folks to be able to get that input they see these as le- it is a legitimate part and parcel of the process what is happening which is uh, which we should debate a lot more is what does this mean then a for the project of building capacity of state should basic functions of state from preparing an rfp to preparing a ppt be the job of an outsourced big four or should this be about strength 
strengthening the capacities of from the local state cadres all the way up to the IAS. The second question is what happens then to questions of accountability. We are beginning so much, you know, there was this framework of new public management that came in in a big way in how we think about public administration reform, which looked at private sector principles of management as the way to do it. And contracting out was a big thing that we adopted. It means that if a, if a task is hard, instead of bringing in the skills, you contract out and bring it in from the sure. McKinsey's and gang. And that contracting out has huge accountability questions because a suited booted guy will come do their job and go off to the next project. But ultimately, there was, so... There was an interesting um, documentary research based, which the BBC did almost 15, 20 years ago. I'll see if I can pull it out. But um, ladies, uh, Jayashree and Manisha, on the role of think tanks and, you know, policy f framing, paper writing organizations, uh, you want to weigh in before we get into the... The, I had the a political quick discourse. question. I mean, mostly because I'm very unfamiliar with the policy space. So I guess my question is when you're talking about, I mean, it sounds very frustrating, right? When you're saying that you're contracting things out or that people are picking and choosing areas of research or they're picking and choosing research that exists. So I guess my question is that has, is this dramatically changing? Like, has it changed a lot in the last 10 years or is this just the state of policy and study and so on in India today? Like, is that how it's always been? Rashid, do you want to take that? I think Yamni is better equipped. I think uh, the lot of quality papers are coming. It is not that, but it is just uh, uh, you, uh, you know the kind of application is very subjective, and yeah. that is where there is a problem. You look at I'll tell you, uh, I mean, for instance, uh, you know the Congress when it was in power, I mean uh, the UPA when it was in power, it leaned very heavily on policy matters uh, on the uh, institution called NAC, the National Advisory Council, right, and. Uh, they got a lot of input, some very quality, some controversial, a lot of things. But in the end of the day, when I look back, I find, you see, a co Congress became poorer because no big idea came from 24 Akbar Road. There were no roots, whatever the, you know, uh, sort of say the NAC was offering to them. It was a mix of, uh, you know, Jolewala and policymakers and some very bright people. But the Congress, it lacked that kind of, you know, stakeholders' interest. So therefore, if you look at the UPA tenure, particularly the second one, it politically did not benefit. It just went, you know, sort of drift continued and it was a, a sort of, you know, downhill uh, sort of journey. So therefore, I am saying that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, policy papers are very good uh, for a political party or for a government if it is bringing some kind of uh, electoral benefit. And many times when it is done from a, what Yamni is saying, purely from an academic point of view, that goal is not achieved. Uh, Yamini compared the work of uh, policy wonks as journalists. So it's true that while their work is supposed to be critical of you know, government intervention, government schemes, policy, it's not necessarily antagonistic. Hmm. In the way that sometimes journalism can be, where journalists almost, at least the ones who do journalism, sometimes pride themselves at besting the government or putting the government in their place. There's this tussle between, you know, journalists and governments. I think one of the most rewarding aspects of being a policy person is to be able to work with the government, to at least see your work then translate into ground changes. And this is a big question that we need to think of considering the government, current government and how, you know, appreciative it is of criticism and how swift <laughs> the appreciation is, is in, in, in many cases. How do you begin to work in such an environment as a policy worker when... Uh, the very act of criticism is labeled as anti-national. Or not even criticism, audit. Or audit. So how do you, how do you fix it? Let's call it criticism. Yeah. An audit it's which will exactly. throw up results like audits Which do. will ultimately help you it's do like better. It's like saying my CA when he audits my car, Amit, you don't have Exactly. So how do you even begin suggesting interventions when you can't even acknowledge that there's an issue? Hmm. And yeah, that and is that, a big, that, uh, that comparison theme. I was making was on the core principle of truth-telling. Yeah, that, yeah, you know, for sure, boy, for sure. Yeah, but I, right. I think, yeah, I mean, even for young professionals who want to, you know, become policy, uh, you know, wonks, this is a question to think of. Lots to talk about on that. After yeah, we finish. We'll talk about. <laughs> so now let's just come to the entire Chunavi Mahal Garam hai for our South listeners and viewers. That means the electoral scene is heating up. Yes. Uh, with Ambur Talaiwa in Chennai. So, uh, using the me, one word I learned from Jayashree. Quickly start. Okay, so let's start with Jayashree and then I'd like to come oh, to Rashid because I Rashid. Know, I was like, what language is Manisha? Yeah, dude, Ambur Talaiwa, you only told she's me. She's just killing our Tamil. I think we should just <laughs> throw her off a cliff or something. How dare she? So good. But, so, Hamari Piari Tamil Kogali. Oh, we have another <laughs> Tamilian here. 
Indeed. <laughs> Too good. Today we've outnumbered the these Nordies. For once. Nordies go back. <laughs> go to hell. So. <laughs> now, now you align with the. Of thumbnails. course, wherever I see the numbers, I'll just. <laughs> in that way, because okay, Rashid, the joke is that I'm half Punjabi, half Tamil. Same. So, okay, so, so, so we switch around. So we, know? depending on the Mahal, you know, we are just. So we are like right now, like if, if my ethnicity was my politics, I'd be joining the BJP right now. <laughs> but, but uh, so let me start with you uh, on the Congress front. Uh, uh, Jayashree and then you know Rashid can tell us because you've written so much about the Congress my specific question I won't come so you can just take it straight from Jayashree is that is Congress inevitable like Thanos I mean whether it is strong or weak or not is it inevitable and are the Gandhis inevitable to that uh, Jayashree first you what tell me what's happening what do you mean inevitable like just is, elaborate is it, it cannot inevitable. not be that it's been there too long it's just it's it's it has so to irrespective stay. Irrespective of the electoral outcome, it's going to be yeah, the principal it is opposition be, party. It is going to be. A, You're saying is there like it, an India after Congress correct, once it correct, goes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean not for this election, not for the next election, not for maybe the next few ones. But as to how the Congress might evolve is something that I always wonder about. I mean, for me, I'm very much entrenched in the idea. Of, you know, if not Modi, then who? For me, it's anyone. But also, <laughs> I think the Congress has got that very unenviable position. Right? I mean. It has made terrible mistakes over the decades. And let us say that flat out that Rahul Gandhi is also now the face of it tells us a lot. But I think now it's in the worst position it's ever been because it is sort of faced by this very demagogic sort of polity. You know, the natural party in gov of governance now is a demagogue which focuses on ideas like hatred and so on. So at the time, it's very difficult. It's a, right now, I feel like it's very difficult to counter that with ideas of, you know, good sense and policy and logic. I don't know if there are examples in history of, you know, sort of powerful demagogues being unseated by the force of persuasive and sensible rational politics. So the Congress is trying to do that, but also it can't. So which is why it also sort of resorts to what we would say, what we would describe as soft Hindutva lines, because how else do you tackle it? So I think also, but in a country that's so fundamentally poor and so full of people who struggle, eventually something's got to give, you know, this venom that we see now that we will see in the next couple of decades, something will crack, but... As to what role the Congress will play, I think currently we're forced to sort of acknowledge that it will play a role because mm. we literally cannot name one all-encompassing party of the stature that it has right now. But right. if your question is rephrased to, do I want the Congress to... Be well, inevitable. Die, but yeah, I think it's time. But as to what would take its place, <laughs> I don't know. But then that, I think, hinges entirely on the idea of like, oh, but if we believe in this union of India, then we must believe in the idea of the Congress. So Rashid, you've written this book, 24 Akbar Road, which is a short history of the people behind the fall and rise of the Congress, available in payback, uh, in pay paperback uh, for only rupees uh, 267 Kindle edition, hardcover 1002. See, I'm selling your book for you, Rashid. 381 rupees paperback. You can click on the link in the show notes below and order it. Uh, so uh, you clearly have to have done a lot of research to write a book like this. What What is your take as someone who studied the Congress? I think uh, uh, the Congress of today uh, is not uh, viewed uh, in a dispassionate sense. There are people who feel uh, very strongly for it. And there are equal or if not more people, number of people who feel that the Congress must die, the Congress time time is up and it's very old. Actually, the Congress is very, uh, if you consider Congress as a sort of dead body, it's very alive and kicking. It got... Uh, you know, almost 20% votes in 2014 as well as in 2019. The entire purpose of Rahul Gandhi's Bharat Jodo Yatra phase one, first phase two, was to increase that somehow that vote share of Congress Party from 18, 19, 20% to 24, 25%. Uh, uh, just 5% increase in a vote share in 2024 would change a uh, lot of political equations in the country. It is not happening. I mean, I, I'm saying that because uh, the political climate is slightly different, but I'm saying that was the objective. Uh, Bharat Jodo Yatra to increase somehow a vote share of Congress Party. The vote percentage between Congress and BJP is not uh, very huge. If you look at, uh, you know, 2014 uh, numbers, the Congress got 10 crore votes, BJP got 17 crore votes. In 2019, the Congress got uh, 15,000 crore and BJP was around uh, 
2023 crores. So this is a kind of uh, not. It is the kind of political system we have, and that's where I think Tamil Nadu comes in. It's very important this time around. Uh, 39 plus 1, 40 Lok Sabha seats. Uh, the Congress and DMK are in alliance. If there is a you know poor showing, and if BJP gets 10 or 15 uh, you know Lok Sabha seats, then we are talking about 350 plus seats for uh, for the NDA BJP. But but zero. Then of course things change. So I think Congress position in 137 seats that come from uh, southern part of India, many parts of East India and other parts is very important. So you know it's very simple. I mean just to sum up, if the Congress can get 100 Lok Sabha seats, there is no way that Mr. Modi or BGP will get a uh, you know a clear majority because the regional parties are sitting on let's say 150 seats or so. So 150 plus 50 has become 250. So it becomes, it makes things very done. There are, of course, the, uh, political parties like Bayasar Congress and Biju Janta Dal and the IDMK and all who are not part of any alliance. So 20, 30, 40 seats go to them also. So therefore, I'm saying it is this 24 election is not over. It depends how, you know, what kind of mandate come from Bihar. Again, if it is a, just NDA gets all kind of seats or 36, 38, then it's the story is over. But if it's 2020, Maharashtra, General State, Karnataka, uh, where BGP got uh, 24, 25 seats last time around, can the Congress split it into you know half in the sense that 14, 15 seats going to Congress? All these things are in the realm of possibility. So I think the Congress will live to fight another day. I see. And 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 you think it's important it does, or do you think it's better for politics in general? And you need not have a view on it. I mean. Uh, that think, it it it, very, it dies and someone else replaces it because it seems it can't do without someone, the Gandhis. Someone else? Are you saying someone else is the political party that could not hand, handle uh, you know one scam that is you know getting liquidized? Are we talking about that political party? Which one? It came up with a lot of Which promise. Up, up, up. Oh, okay. So look at that. Look at that kind of in their court. They are so badly. Is Aap the only thing that can them. replace it on a pan India? There's there's nothing else that can. Replace Every it. political party has that. Nothing had, else, no. Aap, Aap, Aap had a very progressive kind of agenda. It was not uh, you know uh, sort of you know divided on the caste lines or this uh, you know Hindu Muslim uh, votes uh, etc. I think it had uh, it has a lot of potential. I won't say it had, but the way you know the courts and the legal web is tightening, there is a very serious attempt to actually liquidize that political party. Yeah. What they're going to do in time to come uh, that they may name uh, Amadi Party as a sort of accused right. or a benefit like, like of a the corporation. Stamp. Correct. Hmm. And, and and finish it off. It will, of course, it will come in another form. But this is what I'm saying. So I think the role of Congress is very important. A lot has been said, written about Gandhi's. I think there are two things I very quickly I want to say. That is, one is, of course, Gandhi, Gandhi's have, you know, illusion of grandeur. And that is where they think it is their duty <laughs> to hold on and be on the sort of, you know, leaders. But they are not, they are not, they are, they are not power wielders. They are trustees of power. And hmm. that is their problem. Because if they had done that, perhaps things would have been slightly better. Uh, and second problem is very fundamental question uh, is whether the Congress is failing Gandhi's or Gandhi's are failing the Congress. Congress is not used to Gandhi family's failure. Uh, 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 Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru was there till the last day when he was Prime Minister. Indira Gandhi died as Prime Minister. Rajiv Gandhi was at a comeback tale. Sonia Gandhi back to back victory of 2004 and 19. It is only Rahul Gandhi who's who's seen as a uh, uh, as a failure, if there is in 2024, if the Congress fails to get even 100 Lok Sabha seat, he, he will be, you know, we would end up as as failure. But what is the rest of the Congress party doing? All the heavy lifting, and I'm saying on the basis of some uh, analysis and data, that all the heavy lifting in election uh, campaign uh, is done by, you know, three Gandhis. If, you know, the demand for, uh, there is a Congress control room, very quickly I'll tell you. Uh, there is a Congress control room, so that if there are Congress is fighting 350 seats, so all 350 candidates uh, ask for leaders. Uh, you know, I mean, you'll be surprised, you know, what is the demand for this? So after the after Gandhi, people want Sidhu to come in, not just Sidhu, people want, uh, I mean, Govinda has shifted loyalty now, but people like Govinda, people like Muhammad Azuruddin, people like, uh, you know, uh, Nagma Muradji to come in and campaign for them. There is no demand for, uh, you know, all those big wigs of the Congress Working Committee or so in a you know, pan Indian uh -huh. sense. Even Shashi Tharoor, their very, very, very localized kind of demand is there. You know, I, I have said this in the Hafta in the past. I don't think it's a happy situation, but I, I think Gandhi's is the glue that keeps the Congress together. So I really think there's an inevitability to the Gandhi's as long as the Congress is there. Because 
I don't believe anybody else can take over and keep the Congress together. It will not happen. It will splinter off. So whether you like them or not, I think from the point of view of just keeping the Congress together, it has to be the Gandhis are the group. But I think the biggest failure and maybe that's of politics in general and that is the contradiction in leadership is that the Congress, and I think that's true for most political parties, even the BJP, I mean, BJP now under Modi, he's cut down leaders to size, although they are leaders. The Congress has never had any leaders other than the Gandhis. For example, you know, whether it is Sindhya, whether it is RPN Singh, whether it is all these other guys who flipped, they were never leaders. What I'm saying is, they spent 20 years, you know, buying themselves to the Gandhis. Now they're spending the next 10 years buying themselves to Modi. They are basically, they will... They they will you snap and they will jump and say salam sab and these guys are touted as quote unquote leaders, and the problem is the biggest political parties are full of such quote unquote leaders. There is no leadership in any of these people. They are just there. Ya do Gandhi's ke bharose ya Modi ke bharose, and that is I think the failure of the Congress especially, and possibly that's that's what politics has become because it is. Yeah, the superstar will get to the votes. Everyone else is irrelevant. Yeah, I think you want to say something, Rashid. It is that white collar that has failed Congress and Gandhi. You see, Indra, Indra Gandhi was very clear. She did not allow a, a large, very large, you know, a set of uh, social acquaintances and friends and all. She did not bring them to uh, politics. It was Rajiv Gandhi who did it, and those, you know, the two Aruns and several others and Amitabh Bachchan. They all kind of, you know, led to Rajiv Gandhi's downfall. I think Mr. Mani Shankar Iyer has written a lot about all these things, and then you. Know, no, same mistake uh, Rahul Gandhi made. A lot of these, you know, the problem... They're not his friends. I mean, let's be clear. None of them are his friends. No, no, no. They were not friends. They were all his contemporaries and, you know, people who were sort of, you know, achievers in their respective people. You must know that white collar, white collar have a problem. You see, I would be first, I will protect my honor, my dignity, my, you know, sense of ego. Then I will look after, you know, my leader and my organization. And this is exactly what has happened in Congress. See, those Chaprasis that we were talking about, they stayed on and they were very, very, very loyal to, uh, you know, to, to the Congress. It is only people who are, you know, best and brightest who are Rahul Gandhi's contemporaries, earlier time, Rajiv Gandhi's contemporaries, they have left because the moment they realized their position, their image, their uh, sort of, uh, you know, was hurting, they left and okay, they, of so course, the other side was there to welcome them. I'll go to Yamani, but you had provoked me earlier, but if you're referring to Sindhya as a best and brightest, I will come to that. No, I mean, I mean, I, I, I would not keep that guy in news laundry to, uh, you know, even make sure that the inventory of the studio is okay. I mean, let's let's be clear. What is the level of these guys? They happen to be born into privilege. They happen to once again finish. They happen to be born into privilege. If he was not a royal, he would be struggling to get the job of a receptionist. I will guarantee that to you, and I'd say that as someone who has also known him. Let's be clear: the caliber of these people. I'm saying this is in my book, uh, House of Siddhyas, I have mentioned it is not Gandhi's, it is Siddhya family, which has been, you know, in power from, uh, you know, 17th century till date. There yeah. is not a single day of independent India when a member of, of uh, Sindhya family was not a member of Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha or the State Assembly. Hmm. This is a unique distinction that even Gandhi's and Nehru's do not have couple of things. I think it's worth recognizing that across all political parties, it's not just Congress, BJP, look at every single regional political party today, uh, the tendency of uh, inner party structures to have become completely centralized into the cult of personality of one and at most two, and usually the second is a, is a family member, uh, is now... Uh, it, it's it's part and parcel of the of the political culture of India. I, it's it's across all political parties, and to me, the question to that we need to ask is why is that so? Particularly with uh, a large number. So so let's look at our uh, North Indian regional parties from BSP to SP to JDU. These emerged out of deep social movements of their political movements of their own kind. The, the caste movements. There was a f particular kind of grassroots mobilization that then built up the edifice of these as political parties, once they came into positions of power, they kind of drew on state power into themselves and their whole modus operandi became about their ability to dispense state power mm. to, to the constituencies that they were appealing to voting for. And I wonder whether that 
kind of very particularistic politics that emerged out of it has also fed into the need to then keep the whole structure of the party deeply centralized. I think that we need a lot more thinking amongst folks like us who observe, who participate, but, you know, who, who aren't part of the profession of politics to really try and understand why this tendency of centralization has become so key and the emergence of money as such a key issue. I mean, right now you all have done this yeoman's work on electoral bonds that are giving us at least some understanding of how the relationships work. But money and muscle has been a crucial part of this whole story of India's politics as we as the Congress started atrophying and regional parties came up. And uh, perhaps because money became so important, the need to centralize, because lots of bags of money are coming in. Whoever becomes, controls the purse strings uh, Yeah, and who is coming in? Look at the entry barriers into politics. So you can only enter politics if you have, if you're Papu Yadav and you have the muscle power or to or be if you can contest election, the finance minister of the country says, I don't have the finances to contest an election. I mean, I know for a fact, you know, all parties, one big determinant of who they give a ticket to is, will the party have to fund the election? Can you fund it yourself? Which kind of inevitably <laughs> creates the conditions for the... Uh, bachas and the nephews and the nieces and everybody uh, to show correct. up because it uh, it uh, gives you gives you that entry point. So it's I I, I you know there, there is a there's another so, so this kind of very strange centralization breakdown of inner party democracy across all political parties. Mm. I think the BJP is very interesting for that reason because it does have the base of the RSS. Mm. I mean it does in its in its own way it emerges out of a particular type of social movement and the base of the the RSS cadres are still are are robust they are strong they're everywhere. Um, how are the two now intersecting with each other? I, it's I, it's too early for anybody to say, but I think that these are the things to look out for in terms of where we go from here and to answer that big question, is, is Congress inevitable or if Congress is not inevitable after Congress, what? I, a lot has to do with the breakdown of Cardas of, of party cadre structures and the breakdown of the relationship between grassroots mobilization and electoral politics. Manisha? Is Congress inevitable or not? I really don't know. I don't think I'm equipped to answer that. But I just want to shift the conversation to, you know, look at it from a slightly different frame of what the Congress has been able to do in the current electoral battle. There's a very good front page piece in the Hindu today by CSDS, which basically says that there are three things that define an electoral battle. One is agenda setting, which the media does, opinion makers, chatterati. The second is what a political party does in the sense issues that a political party believes that matter and they'll galvanize people on that. So BJP will make Pakistan an issue even though it's not an issue. Hmm. And the third will be the voters' reality. It's important to remember that voters are not bots who just press Lotus because Arunab told them or they press on you know the hand because Rahul told them. Hmm. So they are assessing their own reality and they've done a survey where it says that on the third aspect, the key issues for voters today is not Ram Mandir, not Vishwa Guru, uh, not even corruption, it is unemployment and price rise. And we've known this that over the past two, three years, these are key issues that everyone's talking about. Everyone who's been to the ground, even for state elections. In such a scenario, you have to ask questions of the principal opposition party on why they haven't been able to galvanize this sentiment into tangible anger against a tenure incumbent now. Mm. That is a very serious question that Congress has to answer, irrespective of the results. And to my mind, you've had confusing, I think, you know, agendas. So you have the Pyar Ki Dukaan, mm. which is again, doesn't really talk about unemployment price rates. You have, then you have an alliance. If you just look at the last one year, you have an alliance. I think by July, India was in place. August, the whole rank and file of, you know, Congress is committed to Rahul Gandhi's image on his Nyaya Yatra, uh, you know, as this Jan Nayak who's going to take on Modi. There's a Nyay Yatra, but again, it's not really clear what Nyay is. The signaling is not very clear. So I think for sure, I don't know if it's Gandhi or not, but for sure Rahul as, as the most important Congress agenda to the point that there were problems between TMC and Congress and we don't have an alliance in West Bengal now. Apparently, Congress complained that, you know, TMC is not giving us permissions. It was causing rift between the alliance partners where they said, look, you have gone on a Yatra and we want to do seat sharing. So I think there is a huge issue in terms of galvanizing the voter, galvanizing some sort of sentiment. And it all boils down to just the intense focus on Rahul as the prime ministerial candidate. I think uh, 
Do you Can want I to say something just on that? Just very quickly come in on this. I, so, so I think there's a few things. Um, th- there's no question that unemployment uh, is a very serious issue. Uh, but I have a wonder, and, and, I, but, and I do think that for all its flaws, and I'm not taking away from anything that you said, I agree entirely. Uh, it's not like the Congress hasn't repeatedly, or for that matter, the India Alliance hasn't repeatedly tried to push the unemployment question, the Berosgari question comes up repeatedly, and it's very much even front and center in the manifesto that they have pr- produced as well. The but why is it not catching? I think we need to go a little bit beyond party strategy to answer that question. I, and, I, and I think that there are two issues here. Number one is that we've always had jobless growth. It has been a consistent Achilles heel of the nature of Indian mm. economy after 1991. Remember, Narega came, that whole ba- inclusive growth story of the UPA in 2004. Mm. Narega comes so on the back new of on that, So n- in a it has gotten sharper, bigger. It's not ending. So the and the demographic structure is now getting it to that boiling point of becoming a ticking time bomb. It's a problem that we have to solve. But has anybody got an answer? That that's uh, it, it's it's an old problem. It's not something that is only Modi's creation. He's not solved it. The second thing is that there also is for all the Adani story that Rahul Gandhi will produce regularly. There is a broad based consensus across the country and the with voters too on the trajectory of our growth it's not like we are particularly enamored by the left so it's not that there's an alternative broad economic imagination that any political party can present so what are they doing they are saying ye wa, ye unemployment ka ek ye le lena uh, 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 right. apprenticeship ka ek kanoon main bana dunga kuch aur ka everybody is only so answer to this and, problem is and, i, no, I want to come back to this rashid has to go we'll come back to this rashid has to go i'll come to you manisha so rashid before you go just uh, like i promised in the beginning of the show that we'll take on this issue of you can't use religion to ask for votes. Oh. Uh, the election commission. A, I'm not. I wasn't aware that there is such a rule, because I attended a, a debate at the National Law School, Bangalore, uh, where uh, me, I think I, me and Asaduddin were on the same side. On the other side was Sandeep Dikshit, and I forget who else. Where the debate was that should religion be allowed to? Uh, should you be allowed to seek votes on the basis of religion? And I was like, of course you should for any identity. So, A, this Arun Govil going, the ECI has issued a notice or someone's complained. There's just a complaint. No There's notice. a complaint. So, I don't think there is a rule that you can't seek votes on the basis of religion. If I mean, if there is, I'm not aware of it. And I just, before you go, I want your view on it because I want the panel's view. Do you think, I mean, whether it is being done tastefully or not is a separate point, but should there be any rule of not using religion to ask for votes, Rashid? What's your view? And then we'll go around the panel. I think uh, we must understand that uh, Indian democracy, uh, the West Minister model of parliamentary democracy, there is a lot of thrust on uh, propriety. Britain doesn't have a written constitution. Defections are very rare. In India, in Indian context, the issue of propriety was best described to my mind by Mr. Lal Prasad Yadav. He said, I have seen uh, hockey ground, football ground, polo ground. Huh? Uh, what is this model ground? And Mr. Lal Yadav... <laughs> You know, he got away with it. And a lot of people feel this way. So therefore, uh, whatever, if at this point of time, when you say about your question is very valid and serious, but I am saying there are no uh, takers because the MCC, Election Commission, uh, political class, they itself, you know, they are absolutely clueless. And people are not the stakeholder, ultimately the voters. And, uh, uh, you know, they don't object about it at all. But do so you think there should be a law against it? Do you think that, it, that you should oh, not be allowed? There is no point. It's like the hedge law. You see, you cannot, you can have law, but if there is no How social you... acceptability or aversion towards it, then it is not going to be, you know, applicable. So therefore, politicians, political parties, uh, candidates, they get away. And you look at how many times election commission, I'm not talking about election commission of today, but of past all 30, 40, 50 years, how many times you know, people, I one instance I remember is of uh, uh, Balasar Thakare, who was a, uh, uh, disfranchised for uh, for six years for uh, making use of you know uh, religion in politics, but uh, did it undermine uh, you know Thakre's position? Thakre became far more stronger, and his political legacy is there. And now, I mean, Congress and Sharad Pawar, who all their you know for decades they were opposing uh, you know Balasar Thakre, they are now uh, you know friends with the son. So, uh, point I'm saying is this is not this is this is an academic question. This is a policy question. 
but you know in in, in the public domain in uh, voters mind this is not an issue all political parties and individuals they start their day with a you know temple visit or religious place and they go there and campaign there is nobody there's nobody who can object and walk if yeah. ec goes on to disqualify people you know the entire election will have to disqualify over. everyone so i'm saying unless we have an awareness we have imported a political system that puts a lot of thrust on uh, propriety but if there is no idea of propriety if the idea is just to you know uh, win and win at any cost by all political parties then what is the what is the kind of thing that we are talking about okay before i come to uh, jashree there is a rule in the model code of conduct which says there shall be no appeal to caste or communal feelings for securing votes hmm. mosques churches temples or other places of worship shall not be used as forum for election propaganda i don't know what world the election commission is living in but anyway no, no, and, it, so, and it it is not it is not a you know it doesn't have any statutory status that yeah, it's advisory correct it's so what do you think yeah. jashree no i mean i completely agree with keith i don't see the point of this so already the bjp is getting wildly popular because it is bringing to life that decades long promise that people have wanted right which is the idea of in- of india as a sort of hindu rashtra and now they're finally seeing it come to fruition so in that is the basis of politics and it's so closely closely intertwined anyway with religion how does it matter if the election commission is saying you can't it says you can't use churches gurudwaras temples mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so on it also says that you must not um on caste or should, communal lines you should ah, not you should ask for cause votes. tension or something on the basis of religious groups and then if this man who once starred in the ramayana is waving around a photograph of the, of lord ram and all i don't see I mean, it's just to be expected. So maybe they're trying to make an example of him by cracking down, but people no, are no, but they're not. There's a the complaint. Time, right? Nothing has happened. There's just no, a so complaint. Then, so then, what, what is the, the point? point? Can I, can I so, on this Ram issue, can I come in? Please. Very quickly. You see, you remember in 1988 there was a by-election in which, uh, you know, when Amitabh Bachchan resigned in uh, Allahabad, there was yes. a by-election, and Vishwanath Pratap Singh was contesting against uh, Sunil Shastri, and the Congress, uh, you know, uh, took Mr. Uh, Arun Govil in full that kind of you know television gear <laughs> of of Lord Rama to campaign. That is what I'm saying. So now that political party or people who are something that political party are criticizing and opposing uh, uh, Arun Govil again in Meerut and you know bringing a, 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 a kind of, a kind of a photograph of Lord Rama and uh, you know showcasing it. Point I'm saying is this is this is a case of double standard. i will i would say that what the congress was doing in 1988 87 was wrong and what bjp is doing in uh, in 2024 is, is wrong but the fact of the matter is people are very cool about it hmm yeah the also, up song in bjp for the bjp their anthem was jo ram ko layenge wo hum unko layenge hmm to wo to kya hai matlab it's just baked into the whole thing i don't sure. think the ec can do anything about it i'll just come to uh, um, yamini but before that uh, thanks you so much for joining us uh, mr kidwai uh, pleasure talking to you we shall have a longer discussion on the inevitability of congress and many other things but right now you have to go have a fantastic eid next time please thank come you, to our office much. with which is which we, I and mean, that's a standard thing you tell all your muslim friends yaar biryani nahi khilai because <laughs> that's just the standard on eid but uh, before you go can you recommend something other than your books the links to which will be found in the show notes uh, any th- reading I, writing watching that can enrich the lives of our listeners yeah i think if you refer to in the beginning of the program the contenders i think it's a very uh, good book to read uh, by priya sagal right okay so you've recommended the contenders thank you i i must say before you go and that discussion you know what really worried me about mr ram madhav and it worries me about each time he speaks he is considered one of the intellectuals of the rss unless i'm wrong and you know when this whole contender thing happened he said predictably you know what's the point of this book and all these i mean i'm paraphrasing and all these list of people that seat is not vacant till 2047 i don't know what calculation he has that till what age mr modi will continue to reign supreme etc etc but he's saying it doesn't matter what we say that's not democratic what vote is democratic and i've heard him say this several times and i find it deeply worrying if that's what he believes because i think that is what the rss believes that the only democratic process is whoever was voted and everyone has to listen to him like a conversation like this it's not like what we are saying here is going to change policy but this is a part of democratic process a conversation on who should replace mr modi or who is a contender his understanding is that how is this democratic who are we to say who are... i held my head and i was like will no one correct this guy and this is his understanding of democracy then we are fucked you know we are in deep shit because vote Whoever gets election off for Jordan five years, wins. for five years, just salute and say yes, sir, yes, sir. So I'm really worried about what democracy means to, uh, and I'm guessing that 
if he is the thinker you know, bjp in a very smart way has blurred the kind of fine distinction between the indian state and indian government and mm. this is what the masses are so if you criticize mr modi you are criticizing you know this uh, union of india or state of india mm. and that is a very sub thing yes on that question on religion do you think there should be a rule against or, or any community identity i think i mean i i think seeking uh, votes to represent uh, the anxieties the needs the priorities of communities is par par for the course uh, that is what democracy is about we've had a very live debate over the last 5 years about muslim representation in parliament for instance in the context of bjp and um, often the argument that is presented is well uh, you know why do you assume that only a muslim can represent muslim issues to which my response is very simple in which case why do we need women's reservation mm. ultimately uh, there is or a, the concept of democracy uh, itself you, let, you know <laughs> let, uh, now, now don't go that far <laughs> that's too hard to grasp but at least let's stay with if you're willing to do women's reservation because you believe that you need more women voices in parliament to represent women's issues mm. presumably you need to apply the same principle to the question to, to all, the muslim all, question on representation all groups, as well sure. okay anyway uh, but so so i don't have an issue with that what i do think is uh, where we need to draw the line is when questions of representation get blurred with what get what what very quickly becomes the equivalent of hate speech mm. the equivalent of demonizing particular communities the equivalent or the equivalent of of spreading violent messages and that is happening consistently in our elections that's where the election commission should be more i think you know in 2019 referring to certain communities as termites referring mm. to majority minority mein aa gaye you know these kinds of state statements are equivalent in my book to the equivalent of hate speech and must absolutely be disallowed because ultimately we adopted a constitution that was baked that baked within it the core secular principle the core secular principle in india was about principal distance of state from all religions if we staying with specifically with the religious argument that is the role of what a politician is supposed to do when they are seeking votes because they represent what they will do when they come into parliament So Manisha, you were making a point before no, we I... segued into uh, what Rashid were we talking about? Ha, huh, on the anim- on this, I was I completely agree with Yamini that uh, hate speech is what we should look at. I don't think we can stop even on the basis of caste, and it can be uh, counterproductive for parties, social justice parties like a BSP. You know, whatever they, however they communicate to their voters, and why it's important for Dalits to support Mayawati. So the same thing can be flipped and used against sure, them. So right. I think hate speech is what you should focus on. We were talking about unemployment. Why that's not an issue, hmm. or why uh, an opposition party has not been able to galvanize the anger on unemployment? I completely agree that it's true that when you talk to a lot of people who say unemployment is an issue, they don't have an immediate answer to who can solve it. Hmm. A lot of them will say Modi in his third term should focus on unemployment. Uh, but i think that's where politics has to get creative a lot of politics is about creating bubbles creating myths selling sentiments that may not be real mm. you know modi does that every party does it tmc does it aap does it but it's opposition's role also to bust those bubbles mm. bust those with repeated communication of look at the lines outside you know exams state exams look at agni veer what they're doing to agni. so i do think i'd still say that it can be done by an effective opposition galvanizing that concern or anger about unemployment and inflation congress did it very effectively in karnataka with price rise where they very effectively targeted the bjp on cylinder price that was a key feature of their campaign just cylinder prices but it was repeated consistent communication with the voters that this is what you need to vote on this is where they failed you this is what we'll do right i think it's a question of resource allocation we've discussed before i mean i completely agree with you but i think it's easier to do in a restricted geography just like आप कुड बिकम अ थिंग ओनली इन डेली आप कैन नॉट बिकम अंग इन यूपी और कर्नाटक कथनी और करनी में फर्क ऑफ ऑफ अरविंद केजरीवाल एंड देव गॉट वीडियोज ऑफ हिम फ्रॉम ट्वेंटी इलेवन एंड ऑल बट इफ यू डू द कथनी और करनी फर्क ऑफ पी एम मोदी यू डोंव टू गेट वीडियोज फ्रॉम ट्वेंटी इलेवन यू कैन मेक हाफ एन आर शो विद जस्ट वीडियोज ऑफ लास्ट फाइव ईयर्स but that arts that will not do so i think that is actually cuz the larger the geography the the less you can depend on your carder doing it like uh, i mean i i think it and this i can say for fact cuz i was involved in the first election of of uh, the aap i don't think there has ever been an election in india where a party has won majority in a state with 
no use of any money that was outside the purview of election commission. Like 20 lakh is a per. I know for a fact many assembly seats of less one in spending less than that. Since then, not a single election across any party has been restricted to that. But do you think they could have done that in Tamil Nadu or UP or no chance? It could have only be done in Delhi, which but is... The Congress so, but Congress has you know, a pan-India space it, where you know, it can it, galvanize people. But on that's issues. the problem. I, I I think there are a few things. Don't forget the uh, the, the uh, cadres of the BJP are just... They, 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 because of the RSS, it, it's mm-hmm. just... It's wide. It's widespread. Now they have a complete kabza over the money. That plays a very important role. When your opponent is using big capital in a particular way, then, you know, you really do need the money to be able to counter it at a pan-India level. Right now, Congress only has actually Karnataka as the big money giver and Telangana now uh, to contribute to it and that will be the death of it because it will end up taking so much eking so much money out of capital in both these states that you know it will totally atrophy very quickly but any that that so I I think the money kabza matters in this and the fact that for for, perhaps because Congress was always this umbrella party and post the freedom movement it the the inability to mobilize cadres around uh, issues has always has been for a long time the Achilles heel that is how the and you know Indra Gandhi uh, sort of mastered the art of this so while every village you go to in India even in UP now you'll still find one like you know old man who'll Mm. be willing to be who's a congress old guy somehow the party is not able to that Cadre mobilization, it's occasionally it's tried. Remember 2004, they were going to do some elections for youth congress to yeah, create. Yeah, that, but karte karte, there is something very deep in the in the rot that has set that has made it hard. Maybe it has to start afresh. But this business, and now it's co- got complicated because there's too much big money. So how do you manage these two things to tell the story? I don't know. I mean, I, I do think it has something to do with the personal charisma. and uh, I mean, oh, the, Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, leadership. I need, think a I think, lot of organizations across... Uh, are and, kind of and, and take a cue from and the And I'm actually defining leadership in an even narrower sense. You know, leadership one would assume is picking a good second level, second tier. I'm talking about leadership, pure charisma. I'm talking Salman Khan leadership. Yeah. Entry kya se hogi batao. That is something that Congress does not. They need a Salman Khan like Sher aya, chhe, Sher aya, chhappan ki chhati leke aya. Ki mein ji, mein aapke jaisa, mein aapka beta, mein aapka. Or you know, that is something and I think that is also Chappan, Chappan Inji wali chhati ke saath saath mein ek ideology hai wo I, 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 ideology ka ek appeal hai us, us, usko that's at the heart of it na sab kuch us pe upar to bana hai that, no, that's, that's something that we shouldn't forget your, your diagnosis Dr. Jeshri. no I mean I think we already discussed that now politics in India has devolved to this entire cult of personality right so as much as I still think that it's very important to have grassroots leaders talk about issues are but you do need a face mm. and in the lack of the face the congress will go nowhere so and it is very unwieldy and we saw this also in that very unwieldy stitching together of alliances like everyone thought oh wow India alliance has announced this is it this is some turning point in the entire campaign it was not everything sort of fell apart they were struggling to share seats. The car was like the party workers was fighting with each other on the ground. Now they're pitting politicians against like, al- al- ally is fighting against ally in key seats like in Wayanad and all that we're seeing. So it's just I feel there were so many lost chances. I don't know if whether they, if they had won it or planned it better, would it have made that much of a difference? But I think it could have got like I mean I'm already writing the Congress off this election, but I do think that the BJP at least is that example, right? Two years ago they identified seats in which they were failing. They sort of mobilized forces. They allocated people towards it. They sort of built it towards it. Like in Tamil Nadu, we're seeing an all-out sort of onslaught of the BJP, which I still think will go nowhere. But I think the Congress could have learned from From 3%, efforts. they can get 6% at least. Oh, please. That'll I mean, be, yeah, 6 maybe. And then you'll have prominent headlines. Double BJP doubles its vote share fully, in Tamil Nadu. Yeah. But I, I have my own rant on Tamil Nadu, which, which I Which we'll get to. Yeah, but yes. I mean, before we say bye to Yamini, just since you didn't take the last word, I'll just say that, I mean, the one thing that is clear of the quality of leadership, and that is why your own brand has to be so big, is that the Chief Minister Khattar needs to stand on stage with Elvish Yadav <laughs> to get, you know, eyeballs of, I mean, it tells you all there is to be told about, I mean, you, your hesiath should be so big that you don't need to be the CM of Haryana. He's bloody Elvish Yadav, like some check, <laughs> Chavani from hell 
But that is in, in all of this. That is why all the, the you know you refer to that piece I did in this whole DBT stuff, the direct mm-hmm. benefit transfers welfare system has been the perfect present to all our politicians uh, because it, it allows you to create that emotive connect between the party leader and the beneficiary. It doesn't need the chief minister. It doesn't mm-hmm. need the local MLA. It does Correct. all the anger gets transferred onto the local MP, the local MLA, and the, but the leadership him, and you yeah. and all political parties are playing so this game. Yeah. It's it's like sure. you know CM ne meko diya, PM ne meko diya, mm-hmm. and uh, that's that. And DBT allows you to do this better than anything else because otherwise you needed the panchayat. Now you don't. Before we let Yamini go, uh, can you recommend something that will enrich the lives of our listeners? Well. How about Origins of Totalitarianism by Hannah Arendt? I think everyone should read this. Okay, that's, that's what is your prescribed reading. <laughs> like, cheerful weekend read. Sorry, <laughs> not so cheerful, but I do think that there are very big and deep questions to ask about Indian democracy and all thinking Indians should look to history and also know what intellectuals across the world were doing in times uh, and, and how they were thinking and the challenges that they confronted, especially at a time when intellectual freedom in India is um uh, is is not just Shrinking. in a decline it's 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 really shrunk right so yamini had to leave but before we move on to the emails and feedback for the week um what is happening in the south man this lot of lot of lot of masala my, lot of masala yeah so you sound like rajdeep who's constantly eating fried fish on the streets of chennai <laughs> And then saying, oh, is this the best fish? Oh, this baby crab is so good. I stand with Rajdeep. I really like his election coverage. And Rajdeep is charming. I will admit that. As annoying as he is, he is somehow... I cringe when he's like... And someone's playing the. He's, he's like, really. He's he's, he's become really like sociable. a. He's become <laughs> no. like a slightly unhinged uncle, man. No. Like, yeah. Hashtag. But like I stand one with... of those charming uncles that you don't mind running into at parties. Yeah, You're like, okay, I don't nice. mind hanging out with him tonight. <laughs> it's fine. So my entire thing, though, is that. Okay, everyone is asking me about the BJP and Tamil Nadu, what is happening. And also, yeah. I think it is so much hype. I'd be sticking my neck out a bit, but I feel like Delhi media sees what is being projected. It may not have people on the ground in those constituencies having those conversations. So conclusions drawn are, to an extent, quite useless. I mean, yes, it is a three cornered fight in that there is the AIDMK, the DMK, and there is a BJP alliance, and there is no real other big third front at the point. But is that third corner strong and on the same footing as the other two alliances? No, I mean, they're not competing at the same level. So I think the only thing you can really take away is, one, the sheer desperation, which is the fact that Modi has come back for a seventh time. And also there's some amount of hubris, which is that, you know, we've already won over UP, Madhya Pradesh, and Rajasthan, and Bihar, or whatever, or they think that it's in the bag. So they will sort of train their guns on Tamil Nadu. And I've said it before, which is that without an alliance partner, they will struggle. I know Prashant Kishore has said that so they got three and a half percent in the 2019 election. He says they'll get a double digit. It is difficult, though they are in alliance with the PMK, which will get them more votes. But the BJP on its own, I mean, despite very clever editing of Modi's roadshow, like the, ro- the latest one that he had, he was on a single street. It's a stretch of one kilometer. It's about five minutes from my parents' house. So I know it intimate, like I know it well. And you know, you expect to see those thronging crowds and there were crowds, but the crowds are mostly like because the prime minister yeah. has come to town. So it's the sort of people who come out and look at him, but it isn't really the sort of mass support that we're sort of expected to believe. And also mm. the other lesson is that, yes, the BJP is relentless, but at the end of the day, who are their candidates? Like, So I think they have, of all the candidates that they are fielding this election, I think it is uh, Pon Radhakrishnan and Kanyakumari is the strongest. Despite hype, I don't think Tamil Nadu and Chennai South has a chance. I don't think Annamalai has a chance. I don't think, uh, what's his name, Nainan Nagendran, who is Tiruvannalveli, has a chance. Or I don't fancy their chances. I just think that it has become a very talked up sort of idea that the BJP is really muscling to seize. And I'm not really seeing it or hearing it from mm. like people otherwise. So And the local newspapers point. and channels would be a good assessment for you? Like Yeah, and the up. assessment of that is mostly that the ATMK and the DMK have more people on the ground. They have their local leaders. The BJP doesn't to that extent. Only Pun Radhakrishnan is a mass leader to an extent. So even Anamalai, like for all his sort of fire and brimstone, he doesn't really have actual backers of his own. So right. And even when Modi comes to town, he's just sort of was pushed to the side where like, you know, there'll be one spotlight Modi's in the center and he's in the corner. And Anamala himself has said very clearly he he thinks the BJP will win in Tamil Nadu based on national issues. But national issues do not hold currency yeah. like that in very yeah. disparate sort of states, right? They don't matter. So 
I'm not sure what, I don't understand where that sort of aggressive confidence has come from, but I mean, it's interesting to watch, but <laughs> I'm a little cautious. Right. So, yeah. so on that note, we will get to the feedback. Uh, we only entertain the feedback of subscribers. So if you're paying to keep news free and supporting independent media, then do write to us at podcasts at newslawny.com. I repeat, podcasts at newslawny.com. Better still, click on the link in the show notes below and you will get this pop-up window and you can give your feedback there. Please keep it below 200 words. There's several mails here that are way more and that keeps us from including as many mails as we'd like. So let's first take last week's letters and finish those because there are eight left over from there. So Shivam's written two letters. So we'll just quickly go through them. Um, it says, Hi Abhinandan, I'm not a BJP supporter. I believe in making informed decisions. Why do you not discuss the Hindu-Muslim issue openly? Is it too insignificant to address? But I'm not sure which Hindu-Muslim. Hmm. People will accuse us of discussing Hindu-Muslim too much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, he no, says, I think he's, he's listing out questions that his father raised. Well, uh, that his father said this. Right. Oh, sorry. No, where is his father? Yeah, yeah right at the end. These questions raised by ah, my father made me ponder. Sorry. Basically, what he's saying so is some left-leaning not... journalists argue Hindu-Muslim discourse is a distraction. Um, he's saying it may not be a distraction and every region faces challenges like Europe grappled with black, white issue, etc, etc. So we have our own challenges. Should we discuss it completely openly? And what... the second letter, he says, on the debate in last podcast between Abhinandan and Manisha, I actually side with Manisha, which is that Congress doesn't provide any other face besides Rahul. Say what you will, but a party that made a post only because Rahul was too incapable of achieving any post by himself is sure to make him the PM. Those posts were chairman of the Indian Youth Congress and vice president of Congress. The latter one was later removed. So, yeah. Uh, on the father's questions, I think we have more letters on, in similar vein about uh, the Hindu fear. So maybe we can... Yeah, maybe, but, but, but I do think there is some truth to that. I don't think we avoid it here. Uh, in, I mean, I think we discuss as much as needs to be discussed. But generally, if you're talking about media, I do think that the religion, not just the Hindu-Muslim thing, religion is not discussed... Um, as matter-of-factly and as critically as it should. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of stepping on eggshells uh, when it comes to issues. But I think that's true for trans issues. I think that's true for many issues. But yeah, it's true. And I think that is leads to a lot of irritation of the right. Like mm -hmm. I think even trans issues, they cannot be discussed especially. You talk about it to someone and you just get completely over-the-top responses. I mean, there are certain things which... I mean, I, I think there is a lot to be critiqued on Islam, but it's I don't think a bunch of Hindus sitting should be doing it. <coughs> and it doesn't come from anywhere else. And there's no right time to do it. Like, what's the right time? It's like guns in the US. No, don't do it immediately after shooting because people are still grieving. And after that, it's not an issue never, that you can discuss. So you when can do you discuss? discuss yeah. When do you critique, you know, Islam or Hinduism or anything? So any, you, uh, Do you think there is a dearth of... I mean, I think this also feeds into what he said about... How do we tackle these conspiracy theories? Because a lot of them are conspiracy theories. No, I mean, the idea that the Hindu is the victim, mm. the idea that these hordes of Muslims are coming back to sort of attack us again. And I think it's, I mean, it's difficult to articulate also because you're talking to people who have sort of made themselves or cast themselves as victims in this entire larger story of it. So I know you're supposed to be patient with them and, you know, try and like I do it with my own family. You try and talk to your father and explain to him. But then after a point, I feel like they're only hearing what they want to hear. and. I don't think any amount of logic or rationality sometimes even works. So I think the one thing also that you hear thing. a lot among uh, people is this one thing that people immediately tell you if you ask them why Hindu Rashtra, they'll say that, well, the Muslims got two nations. They got their own yeah. Pakistan, they got their Bangladesh. Why can't Hindus have their own nation? And I think this is where we have failed post-independence that... Um, you know, post independence leaders really argued, debated, convinced Indians of why we needed to be secular. Gandhi, Nehru, Maulana Azad, among others. It wasn't just, you know, we are going to be secular. There was a lot of debate and convincing. And I think somewhere down the line, uh, public discourse, politics, we just forgot to kind of, it's an ongoing process to keep telling people why we are the way we are. And so now we've come to a point where it's just a very common sentiment. But but why why are we like this? Where Pakistan is Muslim. I mean, Muslims got Bangladesh and Pakistan. Why why can't we have our own? So I think no, that's the, a failure of politics, I do feel, and also public discourse. 
because we focus so more on it, brotherhood just superficial mile sul mera tumara no, i think i think it's a failure of um, education and aspiration yeah, not really a failure also, of politics like education also. the obvious question is okay they got it and then what like look yeah. at pakistan a good uh, look at bangladesh they got yeah. it then what happened go to nepal hindu rashtra chahiye to textbook i mean it's mm. it's actually a, a really dumb question that should be dealt with the kind of disdain it deserves and that is i think what politicians are too fearful of doing because of media also because media also doesn't give it the... anyway yeah but i don't think no, but also, i know but i also want this day i want it to be tackled with more mm. no but i think convince... they did they did debate the idea of secularism and sort of agree to it and all in the early sort of constituent assemblies but also there was a lot of pushback on the idea of india being secular right exactly. it was never that yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a cake walk i mean gandhi also, died also no point did they have a consensus it's not that then everyone said we yeah. are all on the same page there was still a lot of dissent on it except now that the dissent is this much much stronger voice and it's in power right the dissenting voice is in, in power. power yeah that yeah. that makes all the difference okay dear abhinandan i want to ask you within the context of social justice is everything and anything allowed is any social justice activist if any social justice activist utters or performs an act that is unacceptable unacceptable to the liberal mind outside the social justice context is it still justified if not then you should at least acknowledge that some acts of shri shri periyar <laughs> are not acceptable even within the context in which they were said period there are plenty of such utterances utterances and acts of his you can read about this in the wire So Ashish I've read the piece that you sent which Anti-gast is anti-caste politics two he sent two pieces yeah so um you know pandya's main points on the latest article of peria so uh i mean one is i mean i'll take specifically what you've said is anything allowed i think that is not for me to allow or disallow if it's not allowed you'll be arrested for it but yeah anything is allowed i mean i'm not talking about allowed i'm like can you back it with uh, an argument that is credible that can convince people so that's why i avoid using the word allowed or not allowed because i you know that's not what i'm talking about but uh, in the context uh, again it's a little nuanced but generally yes i'd say that for example i think when the congress some bunch of congress workers uh, cut a cow and served beef or something in kerala us a few years ago it was a pointlessly provocative thing I think it was a dumb thing to do, and in today's day and age, it, you're not so. But if um, in a village it's done because uh, a Dalit individual was flogged, for example, for eating beef, and in that they sat outside a Brahmin's house and did it, it's provocative, it's nasty. But I'd say yes, it's justified. Um, if you've read uh, this book. and it is a classic example of great intellect being used in very petty ends it's called worshiping false gods by arun shori mm. it's a very petty book and it's very sad a man with such intellect caliber intellectual caliber will write such a petty book baba ambedkar said some very horrible and offensive things but in his context i think yes it was justified so when you say is anything and everything justified i i mean i don't know but the ex- the specific examples that i know of ambedkar and periyar in their context and how their people were treated I'd say they justified. Um, anyway, um. yeah, I think also because the article that in question, I mean, I remember reading the series when it came out, and one of them was that Periyar was a Brahmin hater because hate he for mongered hate among Brahmins. Maybe you would construe it like that, but also it was an outcome of what he was living through at the time. So I get it. And two, when you're saying, are you allowed to say it? I mean, I think literally we've, he's linked to articles in the Wire where. One said one thing about, and these are all written by progressives, mind you. Like they're not written by right wingers, whatever. So one criti- criticized it, then there was a rebuttal, and then there was a third article about it. So this is discourse that exists. Exactly, right? Yes. It is people so, uh, saying different things. So, so I mean, I think it can be reasonably defended. Jamuna Ramakrishna says, "Dear NL team, I listen to both NL Hafta and NL Charcha and enjoy both enormously. I started listening to NL C." which is charcha to improve my hindi but then realize how different they are in the news topic they cover and the guests invited and so now also listen out of sheer interest a question how do you decide which topics to focus on in each edition of nlh and nlc is it up to the week's host or the managing editor suggestion now that nl has teamed up with tnm would it be possible to have tnm's participation in charcha oh getting i don't think they'd be happy speaking hindi maybe shabir speaks hindi so you can get Does him he? yeah he speaks hindi okay. yeah i mean quite fluent I'm sure they have some folks who are fluent in Hindi. I feel strongly that it would be a good thing to provide more access to news and views from South India to those who live in North, 
and only listen to Hindi news reports. Yeah, maybe we can ask Shabi to sometimes join Charcha. Yes, we will. Point taken. Uh, also, the question: How do we decide? Uh, just the host decides. Yeah, it's and me and Atul don't really talk, so I often don't know what he's going to talk about. He doesn't know what I'm talking about. You don't talk. On this, on this, no, yeah. <laughs> otherwise, we talk. <laughs> we don't see what is up on her Haftan Church, and no, we don't. Okay, S. Shrinath says that he's been following our work for a long time as a paid subscriber, and congratulations on all the work we do. He says he lives in the U.S. Uh, and every sort Saturday morning begins with nuisance followed by Hafta, and he usually cherishes the discussion and diverse viewpoints. Do he criticizes? He has critique to offer, and he says on four seventy eight, I found the whole discussion on Modi versus Rahul Kejriwal discussion to be a huge red herring when it comes to India's system of democracy. Specifically, Manisha mentioned when an Indian voter goes to vote, we choose the PM. Ho gaya parliament democracy ka moe moe. With all due respect, we are not a presidential system where the president is separate from the legislature. We are meant to vote for our MPs, and then post election math is meant to define who gets to be the PM. Modi ji says, "Mujhe credit nahi chahiye," but it's largely to his and BJP's credit that they've subverted the foundational mechanism of how Indian voters' voices are meant to count. This is also a significant failure of our civics education, where people are mostly clueless about how government get elected and operate at the municipal, state, and national levels. Uh, I'd suggest getting a panel together to discuss how parliamentary democracies are meant to work and what checks and balances we could put in place. Born up. He's born in Dehradun, yes, and brought up in Dehradun, so he feels a vicarious pride to see folks with a Dehradun connection upholding whatever is whatever is left of the free press. Thanks, Shrinath. A lot of Dehradun people here, but um, thank you. On this, I will say, I, I, of course, I agree with what you're saying in principle, but the fact is that people vote for the leader. I mean, not every not every vote, but the amount of votes that come because of the who's the PM face or CM face. Is I mean, we big. have a situation now where Modi is winning state elections on his face. So you're, you know, you have this persona as your prime minister, and I, I would say that the Congress has also invested quite a lot of their communication into pushing the idea of Rahul as the principal challenger to Modi. It's not just a fabrication. To the point that uh, I think this is what Anand had suggested in one of the hafta, and I think as a Komi Kapoor piece. Also, or Nirja, I'm confusing between the two, but which effectively said that uh, the name Kharge propped up, thrown by uh, Mamta and Arvind, was because Congress was pushing Rahul, and they wanted to subtly signal anyone but Rahul. They were happy with mm. the Congress PM face, so it can be Kharge, but don't push Rahul on us. So, this is a narrative that even they are invested in. Uh, Renu Jha says the point made by Abhinandan on how Modi won't last a year if free press and debates were allowed finds mention in October 1818 article written by James Silk, Buckingham in Calcutta Journal. He oh, knew back then. I'd say this. Acha. Okay. I thought. Wo... Okay. My, my joke fell flat like yeah, all uncle jokes. Like, That's fine. I, I, ref- I refuse to laugh, <laughs> and Manisha didn't I'm notice it. Speechless. <laughs> Of what all, a tragic end. <laughs> of all the remedies proposed for checking evils inseparable from authority exercising almost about absolute power, there's none that can be compared with a free press. Mm. When men know that the eyes of the world to be upon them and that their conduct will be scrutinized by their enemies and friends, they are more careful to act justly than when they know that their acts will be neither seen nor questioned. It's more agreeable to all men to act without control than to submit to the censure of others. Whoever has the power to render him Self irresponsible will be sure to do so. It is the problem of law to set the limits to the exercise of his power, and therefore all men and authority, especially those despotically inclined, and were conscious that their conduct will not stand the test of free discussion, hate this operation of the law, and also the upright administrators. This is produced from a book by Madhvi Divan named Facets of Law. And says that Anand must be fam- familiar with this if he had media law as a subject. In his first year, in fact, Anand has a few suggest. I think he suggested to get her for hafta. She's written some really good stuff on the media. We should actually get her in one of the haftas because I remember Anand telling me about her. Hmm. Okay, Deepti says I've been a subscriber for a while, but this is the first time I'm writing to you. My husband and I are huge fans of News Laundry, especially NL Hafta. Please, please, please read this letter during a hafta episode and make my day. Love the whole NL team, but especially a big fan of Abhinandan. We are proud to be contributing to free news, and your podcasts are the best part of my day. I had a question. I've recently become an NRI. How can I keep paying for subscriptions and contribute to NL Sana projects without causing any issue for you guys? Some organizations cannot accept money. 
uh, from anyone but Indian citizens and residents. Additionally, Abhinandan travels to so many countries. Why not New Zealand? It's beautiful and we'll be honored to hear you in person. Also, we're tired of being surrounded by a diaspora that's so communal and bigoted. We sometimes go out of our way to avoid Biffin. <laughs> if you hold an event in Auckland, I might, I might actually get to see people who see India as more than the land glorified by the sacrifices of our dear dictator. I know I sound selfish, but it would be nice. Yeah, and you can eat some good avocados also. Yeah, so Deepti, first <laughs> okay. of all, uh, <laughs> most important things first, you can continue to support us. There is no issue of subscribers. Basically, look at News Laundry as subscription, like an Economist, a New York Times, a... Uh, Economic Times, uh, uh, Indian Express. We are offering a service. We are subscription-driven enterprise and we can take subscribers from anywhere in the world. So on that, there's absolutely no problem for us. Only if you're an NGO or not-for-profit is there an issue in taking for FCRA, you know what Yamini was talking about. So on that, do and tell your friends, contribute. Thank you so much for your support. Really appreciate it. I will check if there are any universities in Australia or New Zealand that want to invite me. But usually whenever I go, it's because I've been invited to speak at some university. So I fly there and I do, you know, one one chidiya se do nishana. No. Teer se. One teer se do nishana. So I go there and I do a subscriber meet also. But yes, so we we'll need keep to be this called in Some university there needs to call us. Yes. <laughs> Um, so the other letters from Sandeep, he's a big fan, loves Charcha and uh, subscribed for Charcha. And he says, I really, and he says that one of the episode with uh, Dr. S.Y. Qureshi was one of the best. I really got to know a lot about elections in our country and its magnanimous scale. He never imagined that uh, given my limited school of thoughts regarding, cut this out. His remarks about three takeaways from Rajasthan CM election when CP Joshi lost really ignited <laughs> yeah, the spark I, I in that. me to vote again. Are mm. wah, that's good. Uh, the question here being, is there any way an Indian citizen while living abroad can vote like in the nearest Indian embassy? I fell into horse of propaganda and disinformation as a first time voter years ago and I want to rectify it. <laughs> Lastly, your podcasts are really thought provoking, full of knowledge. They really put my mind to work when I'm driving long haul and News Laundry has been my companion on the roads for so many years. Yay, that's really nice to hear. Says uh, he does miss Daily Dose and a big hi to me from the land of kangaroos. Hello, hello. Uh, can you please play this video on your show the next time so that some extreme followers have an idea of not portraying an elected representative like a ducking god? So basically the clip is when an Australian man interrupts the Prime Minister. It's the project that creates the jobs and uh, the income limits we've put on... Please. Sure. Let's just move back from there. Come on. Hey guys, I've just reseated that. Yeah, please, off the thing. Sorry, man. All good. That's all good. Thanks. Yeah, I completely agree. In fact, I mentioned uh, this. Uh, I mean, this press conference in earlier hafta. But you're absolutely right. You know, you should be able to talk to your PM in whatever. Yeah, without any consequences like, oh, what will happen now? Vivek says, compliments on the excellent work that you're doing and uh, looking forward to your upcoming election coverage. Just want the panel's opinion on the general elections, which are pretty much a done deal if you believe Godi Media. Personally, I feel some positive momentum building towards the India Alliance and I have a gut feeling that the election will be closer than we had thought. Would like to hear the panel's thought on this. Well, I'm really looking forward to what our reporters tell us because they're going on the ground and they're the best people who can tell us what they're sensing mm. and feeling. We're also going to be hitting the ground. So I think I'll reserve this for the hafta when I'm back. <laughs> but I think Vivek's letter has followed an entire episode where we discussed how, well, yes, you know, when Modi's coming back <laughs> next year. So pessimistic. Hi, you guys are too so... inevitable. I mean, even though I personally Who's believe this. Jayashree was so inevitable about it. Riyani yeah, was so was inevitable there. about it. So, I mean... My friend, thank you so much for your support. First of all, really appreciate it. Uh, but I, I, if you've been listening to Hafta for the last years, I never call an election, ever. Yeah. And I always say that there is no way to tell. I mean, people can say inevitable, not inevitable, but honestly, unless one does a poll at a next different level, there is no way to tell. And that's what I believe. Anonymous says, after having a conversation with a few BJP fans, I've come to realize that it's not just fandom or hate for Muslims fandom for Modi, I'm guessing, not for Muslims, mm. is the idea of India that they have, which is different from what others do. There's this thought process of since we are more in number, we get the priority on everything. I might be wrong in my judgment here. So wanted to know what you think. 
what is the idea of india for a narendra modi based on whatever you've been able to understand how do you think it differs from what the country was built on one of whose cornerstones was equal rights for everyone also just a suggestion your let's talk about series is amazing but you're underselling it right now itna mehnat kiya hai short clips bana ke dal do igyt pe the depth of content deserves more eyes and ears yes aapne hamare mu ki baat chhi li yes right anonymous so ye hum chahte hain we should make reels and yeah my view is that mr modi is uh, idea of india when he started and now is very different i think now he believes he's bigger than god and rss so it will evolve his idea of india today is that modi must be worshiped no matter what and anyone who opposes him should be in prison uh, but i think when he started his idea of india was a hindu rashtra i think right now it's somewhere between a modi rashtra and a hindu rashtra Ma- modi rashtra has he, has he always talked about himself in third person though in speeches like even like way it's, back and all it's or? become more thing? The, it's it's i mean the extent of it is like it's anomalic yeah. level now hmm. Anonymous, another letter by Anonymous says the line of work I'm in. I do interact with a lot of people overseas since Kejriwal's arrest. I've had multiple acquaintances come up to me and ask what's going on in India. Are these things starting to create a splash abroad? Do you think it raises alarms in the West if India starts shedding its democracy tag? More importantly, why is Modi acting like this pre-election? Has he seen hints that the trends are not in his favor, or is it just arrogance? No, I don't think it's for trends uh, not being in his favor. I think it's this. urge for near total control and annihilation of dissent and competition uh, i think it's really i don't even know if it's got to do with lok sabha it could very well be uh, assembly elections so yeah mm. and arrogance of course you cannot you can get away with it but let's see what happens in the delhi elections this letter has been a few weeks coming i thought i'll write it on your 12 years anniversary but i guess what the hell is a strong motivator then well said Manisha I've been admirer through and through and I love your takes on everything but on last hafta if not Modi who argument was appalling to cut short I know Rahul received a lot of chances thanks to nepotism we must not forget that no one else has been hounded like he has with continued scorn and contempt 24/7 on social and news for more than 10 years now people fumble make mistakes but the attention has been astounding when it comes to him he may not be fit to be pm but we have pm who says on camera that he doesn't care to go through the files as a cm Also isn't the job of a PM to be guided by the advisors to devise policy with re- which in which respect he or anyone else may do far better than the current pair playing footsie with our democracy love to have that team thank you for keeping me sane so that's not really my uh, argument i was saying that this is what the voter thinks and now we've discussed enough why how through the episode so i, I hope that answers some of your uh, onika i have a question <coughs> are you bengali why just Because I'm thinking it's Anika, but it's become Onika. Onika. Like Anindya becomes Onindyo. I'm just wondering. Oh, is Onika a different name altogether? So Could yeah, be. that's. But thank you for your support and 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 for. Thank your... you. Yes, thanks a lot. Anonymous says hi, NL team. I've been a subscriber from mid 2021 and cannot thank thank you all enough for your high quality ground reports content, especially podcasts, Hafta and Charsha that I've consumed. I also want to share this. Also wanted to share this site I came across. on reddit which shows eb data in a nice manner has both political party profiles and company profiles with timeline and reference to news articles thought it might be useful thank you i'm going to forward this to our reporters who are still working on the eb yeah. story it's not it's not, it's over not yet. off yet yeah anonymous i think the bias of both abhinandan and manisha is so evident that has been pointed out by subscribers abhinandan thinks that kejriwal is more acceptable nationwide and manisha thinks everything what's wrong with the country is <laughs> rahul gandhi <laughs> Maybe we all need to be more mindful and watch our biases. I hope we were more mindful this episode. Yeah. And you f- took something away from it, but okay, we'll keep this in mind. Anonymous says, "Hi team, just wanted to drop a quick note to say how much I enjoy NL Hafta. I get a kick out of listening to Abhinandan on the podcast, even though we often see things differently. It's like a mental sparring match during my long drive from Gurgaon to Dehradun. Oh wow, you're driving every day from Gurgaon to Dehradun? Every day." I mean, how far is that? I don't think he said no, every day. No, I don't think every day. But then I'm guessing if it's like a regular weekly thing, because he's listening to half the weekly. Mm. But anyway, keep me keeps me wide awake as I ponder how I counter his arguments. If we were face to face, Arya, recently stumbled upon the CPI manifesto and it really caught me off guard. Withdrawal from strategic alliance of the US is one of the points. Can't tell if it's legit or just AI generated in this day and age. If it is real, 
I am curious about your take on it and how the party plans to pitch these ideas to voters. Also, I was wondering if you guys are planning a deep dive into the manifesto of other major parties. On a side note, when is Anand coming back? He's unwell. He should be back soon. But Anand has read uh, that manifesto thing he's talking. I mean, I, I saw I saw it online what he's referring to. What he's refer- it's an excerpt from the CPI's manifest CPIM's manifesto, where they're criticizing India's uh, inability to ask unqualifiedly for a cease ceasefire. And it says that because the Modi government is still trying to sort of soften its ties and keep its ties with the US, that US imperialism is sort of driving India's response to what is a genocide in Palestine. So that was the context. And then I think the critique that came in was then the manifesto. It said that India needs to sort of rejoin the non-aligned movement. Modi has no longer no longer attends the NAM summits. Only I think Jay Shankar went for it in Jan. So yeah, I but- mean, when he's saying how will sorry when he's saying how will voters be okay with it. I mean, I don't think a voter has to agree with every single thing in a manifesto, right? The manifesto is just sort of a rundown of all their ideas and thoughts. Also, so, see, manifesto will always give something to the core voter, the core believers. Yeah. And anti-America is is a core belief of, just like Absolutely. BJP will throw in a triple talaq. I mean, uh, the, it may not matter to everyone, but a core BJP voter will be moved by So they are doing the same for the core voter base. No one in the yeah. country cares. And obviously. just the fact that even given the context of what Russia is doing in Ukraine, so Dipto's podcast with uh, Sitaram Yachuri, he asked him that, you know, the CPIM had actually put out a statement actively uh, supporting yeah. Russia. Kavita which... left because of that, no? Kavita had a huge issue with them. Because of it. So, I mean, you know, and you could make out he's uncomfortable, but that is their hmm. ideological position. So they have to take that position. Yes. We start. That, that confidence that the workers and the farmers have in the red flag on economic issues, yeah. that degree of confidence we have not been able to generate on social and social oppression issues. It became like one of those match the following exercises, <laughs> you know, wherein I really couldn't tell apart the lines of, at the CPI ML, we'll keep it aside for a second. CPI, CPM, I just couldn't tell the line apart. But this reunification talk, yes. right? The CPI always seems to have its door open, and the CPM seems to what have a door half open, mm-hmm. closed. Right now, between the CPI and us, on most of the positions, there's a commonality. But then, you know, the flippant response to that would be that the communists sit across in these coffee houses and they're discussing theory while the country is burning. Yeah, there is, they, you know, there is that's what I don't want to do. Hello, Hafta team. Dave D says was reading an article linked to. Linked in one of Mr. Abhinandan's retweets. Hmm. How much should the nation state be concerned about the growing socio-economic divide between the North and South along with the resentment about it in the South? Hoping to have this discussion as a discussion topic between Newsman and Hafta team. You know, you can just do a let's talk about on it. Let's talk about the North-South divide. Could be very useful. Hmm. Especially after elections when we see what happens. For the Hafta team, mainly from North, how much do you agree with the below quotes? Are we are not mainly from the North. We have Jai Shri. <laughs> The North has been denied development for so long, it has stopped believing in it. And the citizen in the North is content to have become a Labharti. Well, it's... What are sweeping? Eh? Yeah, it's it's a lot more complicated than yeah. that, lately. But I think to the broader question, I mean, it's very simple and it's a non-nuanced answer, is that a widening disparity, economic disparity, among, uh, you know, a population like India especially, you know, they say that the, in US, the disparity is a lot more than India. But that's because their billionaires are way richer than Indian billionaires. Although Indian billionaires have like reached like 92 or something. I don't know what, what the number is. Like in, in Bombay alone, I don't know how many there are. Uh, the difference is that in America, the poorest are way richer than even the middle class of India. So the social friction that can occur is huge. And this example I gave always is, and this is when I was shooting a document, I've like uncle, I'm sure Manisha is sick of it. I don't know if Jeshri's been doing Hafta long enough to get the same story again. I was shooting a documentary in the early 2000s, between 2001-2003 in Rajasthan on water harvesting. Uh, and there, there were, you know, these old uh, royals, quote-unquote, the f- fifth son of the eighth concubine of the fifth nephew of some fucking king somewhere or the other has inherited one Haveli in an otherwise like bunghole village. There's like nothing there. Like n- there's so much poverty, but there's this one big Haveli and they've turned half of it into a hotel and they charge, you know, 18,000 rupees a night. 
that has a swimming pool. People outside don't have water to drink. I think it's a question of time. And in India, the only reason they do it, and I, the same, the guy came out, he was from a fancy public school of India, 24, 25 year old, a 70 year old man sitting there, touched his feet. When he left, I asked that man, like, why would you touch his feet? He's the grandson's age and he's not done anything for you. He says, Hamare aisa hi hota. it's like this for us. I think what disparity does is it does more of that, but it does it in, not in some back or beyond village in Rajasthan, it does it in Bombay, it does it in Delhi. And that's, that's, that's a very fragile society. So you can't have such dis, you know, disparity in a country as poor as India. America can still get away with it. Also, I thought the Bloomberg, I mean, the Bloomberg story, it wasn't, well, the one that he referenced, while it wasn't groundbreaking, I thought it quite clearly and simply sort of identified why there is this sort of disparity between North and South. Also, I think it very well explained why there's so much fear and tension about the idea of delimitation. And I think that that's currently a point that we're sort of glossing over now, which is, I also wanted to bring it up before when I was talking about Tamil which is that I do think the BJP, I mean, my I don't think the BJP will do as well in the state, but also it doesn't really matter as much because from the next election, they'll have eight seats less, right? Mm. So Tamil Nadu will lose about eight seats. Kerala will lose about eight. I think Karnataka will lose, what, two. And AP Telangana together will also lose about eight. So that is also how the entire nature of this election will change. So, but yeah. Hmm. Prasad Vasudevan says, regarding Hafta 277, I have lived in three cities, Bombay, Delhi and Bhopal. I think most Indians for some reason do not know about other Indian states. Delhi person may know about Hindi neighbouring states as they may have relatives there, etc. But they don't know anything about South India. Mumbai people do not even know where Bhopal is. <laughs> and in Bhopal, educated people ask questions ki like, to South India... Hai na, to gora kaise hai? South Indian hai to, to gora kaise hai? In my native place Kerala, UP walas, Biharis, everyone is referred to as Bengalis for some reason. Maybe because India is so diverse, but people are ignorant, not just about party politics, but also about socio-cultural aspects in other regions as well. I totally agree. You know? Completely agree. I mean, we are completely clueless about, and that is why it's a miracle India is, you know. Like a Punjabi has more in common with someone across his border than he does with someone in Nagaland or someone in its... Yeah. Which is, I think, Bollywood keeps us together like never before. And if Bollywood decides to do the role it's doing, we're in deep shit. Mm. So you can write in to us with your feedback, your critique. Most of the letters today were actually quite uh, nice and complimentary. Uh, but do tell us, you know, what you'd like to see better of, where you disagree, you know, educate us so much. In fact, you know, twice I've changed my position uh, on things because of mails that have come from you guys. Uh, and we did a podcast on one of those, Chandrayaan. So, podcasts at newsline.com or click in the link in the show notes below. Let's get the recommendations out of the way. What do you have for us, Jeshri? Yeah, I have two recommendations. So, the first is I read uh, Ramchandra Guha's latest book, which is The Cooking of Books. And oh, yeah. How is it? Oh, it's been such a long time since I've been so delighted by a book. So, it's about the relationship between Ram Goha and his very famously reticent editor, Rukun Advani. So they'd met in college when the more, you know, intellectual Rukun sort of dismissed Ram Goha as this frivolous, cricket-obsessed sportsman. And then he turned into this sort of towering historian. So the story is told about how their paths crossed, how they um, built their relationship through the emails and the letters that they used to exchange. And, you know, the more gregarious, very centrist, optimistic Goha and how he spars with this Rukun over politics and people and personalities how they agree that Shashi Tharoor, who was also in college with them, was, you know, like a bit of a blowhard who mm. wanted to be liked. And it's also <laughs> the history of, you know, OUP in India, how books are shaped. And I don't I don't know if like it appealed to me even more because I'm an editor as well, but it's just so well told and so interesting to sort of see the dynamic between these two. Oh, wow. I want to read men. it. Great job and it's selling like the they're book. <laughs> of a particular time, right? And like all the characters you can think of sort of pop up, like randomly they're talking about things and Mughal Kesavan strolls in and Irfan Habib appears out of nowhere and it's just, <laughs> I don't know, I found it very compelling so it's a great read, please buy it uh, my second recommendation is a long read from The Guardian from a couple of years ago but I only read it um, recently so it's an excellent example of how a single incident can make for a very beautifully reported long form story so basically in June 2019 a man was drinking beer in the garden of his home in London he was looking up at the planes flying overhead, making their final approach to Heathrow Airport, and he saw something falling. So he thought it was a bag, but then it got bigger and bigger, and he realized it was a person. And that person plummeted to the earth from a Kenya Airways Boeing Dreamliner. 
So it is the story of stowaways. It was the police investigation into a man who was trying to stow away on a Kenya Airways, Airways flight. And it's about how these people sort of embark on these suicidal missions to hide in the wheel well of passenger jets. Some survive, most die, but also why do they do it? And who is this man? So the story is titled Out of Thin Air, The Mystery of the Man Who Fell from the Sky. Please read it. So we have two excellent pieces on News Laundry and I really want to urge our subscribers to read them because you have access to the paywall and those who don't subscribe to News Laundry must subscribe to read these two stories. At least one story. One of the stories is behind the paywall. This is a profile of a and and its business and a lot has been written about a and but this is really interesting new information. Uh, I found it quite stunning that as the story details, they have something which is called uh, a PR package, which they have with state governments, which entails any and I camera, maybe following a chief minister through events and charging the government for it. So it has a lot of interesting nuggets on the business of ANI. and uh, So definitely read it if you're a subscriber. If you're not a subscriber, subscribe to News Laundry and read this profile. It's really worth your time. Um, then the second piece again is on News Laundry this one is outside the paywall but it's been funded by our subscribers this is part of the Modi 2.0 report card Uh, it's an election fund uh, project which is the Sena that we have for our election fund and the idea is to assess schemes it's a really deep dive piece on PMJAY which is the Prime Minister's Jan Arogya Yojana which is insurance Really detailed assessment in clear, simple language. A good comparison with the UPA years. A must read, especially in this election time. So uh, I have this one recommendation, which is how the shadow fleet helps Russia skirt sanctions. It's a short podcast from Planet Money's series called The Indicator, but it talks about how Russia, in spite of sanctions, how does it get its oil around the con- around the world? <clears throat> and one country that mentioned several times who's buying oil from them is India. And I was just wondering that all these ships are not registered. So there's, you know, there is a security concern because some of these ghost ships, because they don't have to meet standards of safety, of are they environmentally. So there have been a history of these ships that are not registered in the maritime, whatever regulatory framework of the world, sinking or breaking or leaking. Uh, so I was just wondering what is the legality of these entering India and giving us oil and can they be used for anything it just was I didn't know it was so grey even like official oil that's coming into our country and secondly um, I think it's important we keep reminding ourselves because a lot of my recommendations the last few years have been about the Rwandan genocide purely because what a big role the media played how the world stood back and watched and it was their 30th anniversary uh, last week, a few days ago. And in fact, on their 30th anniversary, Bill Clinton called it the biggest failing of his presidency, not stepping in. Mm. So it's a good time to remind ourselves of that. And there's one podcast dedicated to it. <clears throat> it's from the BBC. Um, so it's called My Return to Rwanda, 30 years after fleeing the genocide. And everyone, every every society thinks that they're very far away from this. No society is very far away from this. We are just a few leaders and a few media houses away from this. So, yeah, these are my two recommendations. On that note, I would like to thank our panel, Manisha uh, and Jayashree, and thank our sound recordist, Anil, and Priyali, our producer, who's going to be going to Kerala. Uh, by yeah, air. I'm not going to be here next hafta. I'll be in Cochin. Yeah, Manisha won't be here next hafta, so... In the heat. Yeah, of course. They don't go then. <laughs> <laughs> It's so cool. Yeah, we've already Delhi. booked the tickets. Oh, is it is it cancelled trash <laughs> charge here or is non refundable? Oh, non. Non. Cheaper to have non. Oh, okay, <laughs> very clever. So on that note, uh, I do hope you will contribute and pay to keep news free. This is going to be a very heavy spending month. We have yeah. how many people traveling? About fourteen, fifteen. Yeah, every, all reporters are traveling. Yeah, everyone's traveling, which is really a luxury, by the way. Huh? Most newsrooms don't have that. And we can do that because we depend on you. So pay to keep news free, top up NL Sena projects. Yeah, we have four. Share it with your friends, yeah. Oh, and maybe we can announce uh, the new show, show that's going to come. Well, we're doing a show with Srinivas and Jen. Yes. Uh, so a six part series. It's a six part mini series, and we may do some more depending on how much money you can top up for us. Because uh, we want to get more and more journalists to partner with us on various shows so we can become the hub 
of you know all journalists around the country across languages so do contribute so we can you know do many more such partnerships and also uh, another very well respected and awarded journalist ridesh joshi is going to be covering the elections along with uh, our teams so yeah i leave you with this song with the hope that you will go from here click on the link on nl sena and give 500 bucks 1000 bucks whatever you can give but fun journalism adios